Good afternoon, and thank you for attending this hearing. My name is Karen Koslowitz, and I am honored to chair the City Council Committee on Rules, Privileges, and Elections. Before we begin, I would like to introduce the Rules Committee Council members and other Council members who have joined us today. I will start by introducing the Rules Committee members. First, we are very pleased to be joined by our speaker, Corey Johnson, as a member of the Rules Committee, as well as Council Member Adrian Adams from Queens, Council Member Richie Torres of the Bronx, Council Member Vanessa Gibson from the Bronx, and we're joined also today by Council Members Calvin Yeager and Council Member Jonai. And also we're joined by Margaret Chin, and I saw Brad Lander here. Brad Lander. There are also, count, well, I introduce them, the council members who are not on the committee. I would also like to acknowledge Rules Committee Council Elizabeth Guzman and the investiga investigative staff members of the committee, Chuck Davis, Chief Compliance Officer, Alicia Vassell, and Andrew, Andre, Andre Johnson Brown, investigators as well as Rob Newman and Kelly Taylor. Today's hearing will address an appointment to the New York City Department of Investigation, known as DOI. Mayor Bill de Blasio has nominated Margaret M. Garnett to serve as Commissioner of the Department of Investigation. The mayor has submitted her name to the council for its advice and consent as required by the New York City Charter. If approved, Ms. Garnett, a Brooklyn resident, will serve as DOI commissioner for an indefinite term. To get us started, I would like to call on Speaker Johnson for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Good afternoon. My name is Corey Johnson, and I am Speaker of the New York City Council. I want to thank you, Chair Kozlowitz, for your leadership on this committee and on the important issue that we will be discussing at today's hearing, as well as all of my colleagues who are in attendance. And I see we've also been joined uh, by Councilmember Robert Carnegie uh, as well. Uh, today, the Rules Committee will consider the mayor's nomination of Margaret Garnett to be the Commissioner of the Department of Investigation. Before I begin with my comments about today's hearing, I want to say a few things about why we are here today. Earlier this year, the former head of the Department of Investigation, Mark Peters, fired Anastasia Coleman shortly after he had appointed her as Special Commissioner of Investigation okay. for the Department of Education. Ms. Coleman repeatedly raised concerns that under Mr. Peters, DOI was unlawfully asserting control over her office. Instead of working with Ms. Coleman to try to address these issues, Mr. Peters fired her. Believing this was done in retaliation, Ms. Coleman claimed protection under the city's whistleblower law. Our whistleblower law is vital <coughs> to the functioning of city government. No one knows better the inner workings of city government than city employees protecting those who raise issues of corruption or other illegal activity is of paramount and obvious importance. One of the DOI's, one of the DOI commissioner's most important responsibilities is investigating <coughs> whistleblower claims and determining whether a whistleblower is entitled to protection. Because our whistleblower law doesn't offer an alternate process for DOI whistleblowers, Mr. Peters appointed James McGovern as an acting deputy commissioner of investigation to independently examine Ms. Coleman's claim. On October 10th, Mr. McGovern issued a report substantiating Ms. Coleman's whistleblower claims, <clears throat> and I read the entire 150-page McGovern report, and I have to say that I found that report very, very troubling. There's no reason to go into the details. Today's hearing is not about the report. At bottom, though, Mr. Gov Mr. McGovern found that Mr. Peters, 
the man charged with protecting whistleblowers, was found to have fired a whistleblower for blowing the whistle on him. Mr. Peters publicly accepted the recommendations in the report and stated that he regretted his behavior. Shortly thereafter, the mayor fired Mr. Peters. As I have said, as DOI Commissioner, Mark Peters led investigations that exposed serious issues at the Administration for Children's Services and the Department of Corrections, among others. He uncovered mismanagement that threatened the health and safety of New Yorkers and corruption that might have compromised the public trust. But the behavior outlined in the McGovern report could not help but undermine confidence in his work, and I understand why the mayor fired him. The council's role is now to ensure that the next DOI commissioner is qualified, competent, and willing and able to assert independence from City Hall that this role requires. It goes without saying that DOI plays a critical and unique role in how the city functions. Along with other oversights, like the City Council, the Conflict of Interest Board, and the District Attorneys, it stands as a bulk work against gross waste, abuse, fraud, and corruption in city government. Accordingly, our city charter gives the Department of Investigation broad authority to conduct investigations that are in the best interests of the city. To do its job, it is imperative that DOI remain independent from the entities it is obligated to monitor, including and especially the mayor. The DOI commissioner must not be beholden to any political figure, and she must be capable of withstanding political pressure that would affect the integrity of DOI's work. Ms. Garnett's public service is impressive. She currently serves as Executive Deputy Attorney General for Criminal Justice. Before this, Ms. Garnett served as Assistant U.S. Attorney for the Criminal Division of the Southern District of New York. In this role, Ms. Garnett focused on violent and organized crime, and I look forward to hearing how, if appointed, this background would inform her work as DOI Commissioner. After he was fired, Mr. Peters made some troubling allegations that the mayor's office attempted to influence the release of DOI reports, and he stated that there are currently several ongoing investigations involving the mayor. I have no idea if this is true. I look forward to discussing with Ms. Garnett how she would deal with pressure from City Hall to influence investigations and how she would approach ongoing matters involving the mayor. It goes without saying that her responses to these and other questions will be critical in this advice and consent process. In closing, I want to say that DOI's crucial role in city government demands that the council carefully scrutinize its nomination before approving it. That said, my colleagues and I are committed to a strong and independent Department of Investigation. I want to thank Ms. Garnett for appearing before us today. I would also like to thank everyone in attendance for joining us and for your forthcoming contributions to this critical conversation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to recognize Councilmember Robert Cornegy, Councilmember Rafael Espinal, and Councilmember Keith Powers. I think. The Commissioner of DOI serves as DOI Head. Pursuant to the Charter Chapter 2 and 31, the Mayor appoints the Commissioner upon the advice and consent of the Council. Before taking a vote, the Council holds a public hearing. The DOI Commissioner is authorized and empowered to conduct any study or investigation which, in the judgment of the Commissioner, are in the best interests of the city. These include, but are not limited to, investigations concerning the affairs, functions, accounts, methods, personnel, and effectiveness of the city agencies over which DOI has jurisdiction. The DOI commissioner also has a duty to conduct investigations demanded by the mayor or the council. The Conflicts of Interest Board also has the power to direct DOI to conduct investigations concerning matters relating to the COIB's responsibility under Chapter 68 of the Charter. Upon request, the DOI Commissioner must investigate any such council and COIB investigation demand within a reasonable time. 
DOI has jurisdiction over any agency, officer, or employee of the city. Any person or entity doing business with the city and any person or entity paid or receiving money emanating from city coffers. DOI also has a complaint bureau which receives complaints from the public. The DOI commissioner is also responsible for approving the appointments of all New York City agency inspector generals and conveys the associated standards of conduct for all appointed inspector generals in order to ensure uniformity of their act activities. The DOI commissioner monitors and evaluates the activities of the IGs. The IGs report directly to the DOI commissioner. The commissioner is required to be a member in good standing of the bar of the state of New York and must have at least five years of law enforcement experience. Currently, the annual salary for the DOI commissioner is $220,845. I want to welcome Ms. Garnett. Would you please raise your right hand to be sworn in? Good afternoon. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but in the testimony you are about to give? Yes, I do. Thank you. <coughs> Would you like to make a, a statement? Sure. Um, thank you, Speaker Johnson, Chair Kozlowitz, and Chair Torres. My name is Margaret Garnett, and I'm honored to be here before you today as the mayor's nominee for commissioner of the Department of Investigation. I'd also like to thank the members of the Rules Committee, the Oversight and Investigations Committee, and other members of the Council for allowing me here to discuss this vital role and my qualifications for it. I grew up in a family deeply committed to the ideal of public service, and for the past 13 years I have tried to honor that legacy as a federal and state prosecutor. I am proud of my reputation for independence, integrity, fairness, and professional excellence. And if I am confirmed by this council, I look forward to bringing those qualities to my work as commissioner of DOI. As a prosecutor, I am honored to be considered to be the next commissioner of DOI. And as a New Yorker, I am thrilled to have the chance to serve the city I love in a new way. I've lived in New York City nearly all of my adult life, and I am raising my family here. The Department of Investigation plays such an important role in the city and can be a force for tremendous positive change for all New Yorkers. In its role as criminal investigator, DOI helps to ensure that New Yorkers have the honest government they deserve by rooting out wrongdoers who abuse the public's trust and unfairly stain the work of the vast majority of dedicated and honest city employees. In its oversight role, DOI can play a vital part in improving the work of every part of city government by shining a light on needed systemic changes, identifying waste and mismanagement, and giving this council the administration, and the public the information required to push for reforms. Finally, it is vitally important to the integrity of DOI that it be independent from the rest of city government and also be perceived by the public as independent. I believe that my career up to this point has prepared me well to meet all of these challenges. I feel lucky to have been trained as a prosecutor at the United States Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York under the leadership of several outstanding United States attorneys. I am confident that the values I learned there will serve me well as DOI commissioner, to be guided only by what is in the public interest with total fidelity to the facts and the law, to do the right thing in the right way for the right reasons every day. In my work as an assistant United States attorney, I investigated and prosecuted a wide variety of cases, including massive tax fraud, embezzlement, major narcotics cases, home invasion robbery crews, and murders. I became the chief of the Violent and Organized Crime Unit, which I supervised for four years. During that time, the unit charged hundreds of violent criminals endangering the lives of New Yorkers and solved dozens of murders, including cold case murders, where victims' families had been waiting for years or even decades for answers. I also became involved in several exoneration efforts in which information learned from our own investigations allowed us to identify and clear a number of people wrongfully convicted of murder in other jurisdictions. I subsequently was named a Deputy Chief of Criminal Appeals and then Chief of Appeals for the Criminal Division. 
In that role, I supervised the entire criminal appellate docket of the office before the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, as well as serving as a legal advisor to the office as a whole, including unit chiefs and executive staff. I was involved in advising on every category of case the office prosecutes, including public corruption, securities fraud, violent crime, organized crime, major fraud schemes, money laundering, and terrorism. For the last year, I have served as the Executive Deputy Attorney General for Criminal Justice at the New York State Attorney General's Office. In that role, I run the criminal division of the AG's office and supervise approximately 150 prosecutors, 130 police investigators, and 150 other staff, including forensic auditors, analysts, data scientists, and clerical staff. The criminal division investigates and prosecutes a variety of criminal cases statewide, including public corruption, organized crime, narcotics and firearms trafficking, Medicaid fraud, patient abuse and neglect, and a wide range of financial crimes, including securities fraud, real estate fraud schemes, and insurance fraud. I also supervise the Special Investigations and Prosecutions Unit, which was created by the governor three years ago to investigate any incident in New York State where unarmed civilians are killed by police officers or die in police custody. Finally, I advise the Attorney General and the civil divisions of the office on issues that relate to the criminal justice system or law enforcement. I have benefited enormously over the last year from the mentorship and support of Attorney General Barbara Underwood, and in particular the way she has led the office these last six months. In a time of upheaval and uncertainty, she has kept the focus of the entire office on the incredibly important work we are doing on behalf of all New Yorkers and inspired us all with her brilliance, kindness, and enthusiastic dedication to the public interest. For me personally, she has been a tremendous example of principled and steady leadership. I believe that I have the professional experience and personal qualities to lead DOI effectively in its vital and important work in the city. I have both conducted and supervised many complex criminal investigations, exercising independent judgment and reaching fair and just results under sometimes intense public scrutiny and criticism. I know how to produce superb written work that is both analytically sound and accessible to a variety of readers. I have built strong professional relationships with key law enforcement partners, including the five city district attorney's offices, the two U.S. attorney's offices, as well as the NYPD and other federal and state agencies. If I am confirmed, I will work to build those same quality professional relationships with the heads of city agencies and with this council in service of DOI's oversight mission. Finally, I'm an experienced manager of people with a proven ability to create and model a culture of collaboration, teamwork, integrity, and the highest professional standards. I hope to earn your confidence and support today, and then go on to earn the confidence and support of the professional staff at DOI, and the confidence and support of the public as we continue to work on their behalf. I'm happy to answer any questions the council has for me today. I would like to call on the speaker. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Ms. Garnett, for your uh, testimony and for being here today. I know this all happened uh, pretty quickly. Uh, can you actually just talk a little bit about when you got the phone call and how you got the outreach related to being considered for this appointment and if you had any pre-existing relationship with the mayor, any of the deputy mayors, the corporation council, or anyone within the administration before you got that phone call? Um, so I first learned about um, the possibility that I might be appointed as DOI commissioner two weeks ago, two, exactly two weeks from today, the Monday of the Veterans Day holiday weekend. Um, I was told that afternoon by a colleague of mine that um, he had given my phone number to Joni Clutter, who's the Mayor's Appointments Council, and that um, he thought she would call me and thought it might be about a uh, DOI commissioner. I spoke to Ms. Clutter that night on the telephone um, for about 30 to 45 minutes. And then um, over the course of that week, I had an interview with Ms. Clutter and with First Deputy Mayor Dean Fullahan. Um, I first spoke to the mayor by telephone on the Wednesday evening of that week for a brief conversation. That was the first time I'd ever spoken to the mayor um, in my life. And I met him in person on the Thursday of that week at Gracie Mansion. And had you had any previous relationship with the mayor or any uh, officials in the administration? No, the only person I know in the administration is Liz Glazer, who runs the mayor's Office of Criminal Justice Policy. Um, I, I know her professionally, we used to have the same job. 
Uh, Ms. Garnett, did you read the McGovern report? Yes. And what did you think of it? Um, I found it pretty shocking. What, what was shocking about it? Um, well, I think the findings and conclusions in the McGovern report um, were very troubling, particularly even more so in a law enforcement agency. I think when you run an agency that's charged with investigating other people, with taking whistleblower complaints, with holding other parts of city government to a high standard of integrity, that the findings there relating to um, abuse of the commissioner's authority, um, in particular disregarding or dismissing concerns raised by professional staff that actions might not be lawful, um, being abusive or threatening or intimidating to your own staff, uh, those things are very troubling. And did you agree with uh, Mr. McGovern's conclusion in that report, recommendations that he made as part of that report? Um, the recommendations seem to me to be sound and grow out of the findings of the report. The report did not call for Mr. Peters to be fired. <coughs> Do you think that the mayor's decision to fire him was an appropriate decision? I think the conclusions of the report provide a basis for termination. If I engaged in that conduct, I would expect to be terminated. I think beyond that, that's a personnel decision by the mayor. When do you think a DOI commissioner uh, should be fired? What are the appropriate grounds for dismissal of a DOI commissioner? Um, I, I would hesitate to generate an exhaustive list. I think certainly if a commissioner were found to have um, engage in any unlawful conduct, em embezzlement, misuse of city resources, um, unethical conduct um, that caused, could cause someone to question their moral authority to lead, to lead the agency um, and have it function in its designed role in the city. Um, so I think there's a, there's a range of potential c conduct from criminal to um, just gross mismanagement um, that could provide cause for termination. And what would you do if a DOI employee raised concerns about the legality of your actions as commissioner? If that happened, what steps would you take? Well, I think the first step would be to hear that person out and make sure that they felt heard, that, that was, there was a culture in which staff felt free to um, challenge me to raise concerns uh, that um, actions we were considering might not be lawful or appropriate. Um, so some of that is a cultural issue. And then I think if those concerns are raised, um, then there's a number of possible next steps, including involving other staff, the general counsel, um, potentially seeking outside advice from corporation counsel or the conflicts of interest board, depending on what the nature of the concern was. How would you handle a whistleblower claim from a DOI employee generally if it was brought forward? Um, well, I think the first step would be to um, consider in, in consultation with other executive staff whether it, would, whether it was appropriate for me or other staff to be involved in adjudicating that. Um, I, I could imagine whistleblower complaints in which I would have, that came from inside the agency, but didn't involve me personally in which I would be able to handle that the same as we would handle a whistleblower complaint from another agency. What if it did involve you personally? If it did involve me personally, I would have to be recused from handling it. And I think the steps after that would depend on the circumstances, whether there was someone else, a senior enough staff person within DOI who could handle it, whether we should involve a corporation counsel or, as was the case here, um, hire independent outside counsel to respond. The McGovern report also raised a broader question, which is who watches the watchman? Uh, do you think that there are any structural changes that are needed so that we can have confidence uh, that any abuses of power by DOI would not go unchecked? Uh, I, I don't think I have any particular structural changes in mind. I think the question of um, how prosecutors and investigators are held in check is a complex one. It's very important, um, I think as we've seen in the news, um, that prosecutors and law enforcement investigators be, be independent from political influence or political control, mm -hmm. partisan concerns. Um, and in order for that independence to be effective, that often means limited oversight by elected officials and, and other bodies. 
I think that having a strong culture of, of integrity, a strong leadership from the top of fidelity to the law and the facts is the minimum foundation. That's the absolute bedrock of um, ensuring that people charged with investigating others are policing themselves as well. So uh, there are several highly charged, supposedly, ongoing DOI investigations associated with the current administration. Mr. Peters said that. He has suggested that his firing was because of his contentious relationship <coughs> with City Hall and pursued investigations that could be embarrassing to the administration. Um, what is your plan for these potential investigations and other investigations that are currently underway? Before you answer that question about the investigations that he disclosed, is it appropriate for him to publicly disclose those investigations? I mean, typically, investigations are not disclosed until there is some type of conclusion or that they're at their end of the investi- that they are that it's found that they have merit and that it's towards the end of the investigation. Should it have been disclosed that there are current investigations? And regardless of that answer, uh, what is your plan if there are such investigations underway on how to handle those investigations should you be DOI commissioner? Um, so I, I definitely agree with the premise that um, investigations should not be disclosed to the public. Um, they shouldn't be leaked to the press. They shouldn't be disclosed to the public until um, the professional investigators charged with carrying that out are ready to make final determinations. Um, there, there are many reasons for that, which um, I can elaborate on if, if you would like me to. Yes, but, please. Um, some of it is to protect the integrity of the investigation. Often investigations involve informants or whistleblowers. You might have um, undercover operations underway and jeopardizing the integrity of the information you're gathering and potentially the safety or um, position of people who are helping you uh, could be put at risk. The, um, I think it's also important that sometimes matters are investigated and a conclusion is reached either that no wrongdoing occurred or that the wrongdoing that occurred should be dealt with in some way short of criminal prosecution. Um, you, when you are a criminal investigator, you have tremendous power over people's lives to ruin their reputations, to cause them tremendous damage. And where people have engaged in wrongdoing, that might be warranted, but where they haven't, um, it's, it's inappropriate for the fact that someone's under investigation to be leaked to the press or, or disclosed publicly, in, in my view. And, and if there are current investigations, uh, again, I have no knowledge of this other than what I've read, uh, how would you handle those investigations that are uh, currently ongoing that might potentially involve the other side of City Hall? Um, so I also don't know what those are other than what I've read in the press, but I, what I can say is that any meritorious investigation that's underway at DOI will continue under my leadership. Independently? Yes. Without interference from the other side of City Hall? That's correct. I have a few more questions, and then I, of course, want to hand it over to the chair of our Oversight and Investigations Committee, Chair Torres. Um, has anyone at City Hall or during this process asked whether were you appointed commissioner and confirmed you would provide them with information about ongoing investigations? No, and if they had, I would have withdrawn my name from the public. You would have withdrawn your name if you were asked that question? Yes. Were you asked to provide any assurances on what investigations you would continue or start? No. What actions would you take if you were ordered by someone in the administration to cease an investigation or attempted to influence its trajectory or outcome? Well, the first thing I do is hang up the phone. Um, I, I, I don't mean to be flip. I, I'm sorry. Um, look, I think that it is important when you're doing important work that affects the city that you listen to stakeholders and people who um, have a valuable perspective on how city government works. That, that could include members of the administration, the heads of those agencies, members of this council and their staff. Um, but what's vitally important for DOI's work and its, its ability to do that work 
um, is that the ultimate decision be driven by the independent professional judgment of the DOI commissioner with the advice of the career staff at DOI. And if I am confirmed as DOI commissioner, that will be the sole basis on which I make decisions about the outcome of, of investigations. And what if you were asked to withhold a report or to change conclusions or recommendations that either you or the professional staff at DOI wanted to include in a report that was handled by the agency? What would you do? I would reject that request. Well, your mandate is to uncover misconduct in city government. You'll work closely with uh, the very agencies and personnel you are tasked with overseeing. That's part of the tension involved with being commissioner of the Department of Investigation. How would you balance working closely with agency personnel while staying independent from that agency when conducting an investigation? So I think that is a, an important balance. Um, I think that, I don't think that there is a necessary conflict between having professional relationships with the heads of city agencies or with this council or with the administration and also being able to evaluate their actions independently. I think, um, and some of the nature of those communications and relationships I would expect to vary considerably between a criminal investigation and what I would broadly call an oversight investigation. In a criminal investigation, it may well be that there's no consultation or conversation with anyone outside DOI that's appropriate at, at any time until um, charges are filed. In the oversight role, I think the goal of that ultimately, of that work, is to improve the functioning of city government. Sometimes accomplishing that goal means calling people to account for gross mismanagement or, or waste. Um, but I think that can also, even in those circumstances where um, a report might be extremely critical, that the ultimate goal is to have the agency adopt the recommendations to change, to improve the way that it functions and the way that it serves New Yorkers. And I think um, that given that that's the goal, that having professional relationships that are built on mutual respect um, is an important part of that. But I think that I could only earn that respect by demonstrating my independence and my commitment to what my role would be as DOI commissioner. Do you have any preliminary observations on the performance and effectiveness of DOI? Um, I think based on my observations as a citizen that they've done really important work. I think um, you highlighted some of those issues in your opening statement, but I think the work that's been done um, to expose the problem with related to lead testing in NYCHA, the um, report on ACS, the uh, Special Victims Division report, I think there's a number of reports that um, have been really important, and I think in addition to those very high profile things, I think the sort of um, less high profile day-to-day -day work that DOI does um, in my experience has been very good. Whistleblowers, as I said in my opening statement, play a crucial role in moving toward, I believe, a more ethical government, and fear of retaliation prevents pre potential whistleblowers from disclosing unethical or illegal conduct. Do you think that our whistleblower protections are sufficient, or could they be strengthened further? Um, I'll confess that I'm not familiar with the details of the whistleblower protection statute. I obviously will become more familiar with that if I'm confirmed as DOI commissioner. Um, I agree that it's extremely important that whistleblowers be protected from demotion or firing or other even less serious retaliation. Um, and I think that part of why the independence and perception of independence of DOI is so important is precisely so that whistleblowers will feel free to come forward with confidence that their complaints will be investigated fairly and professionally. How would a subordinate describe your management skills and leadership style? Um, I think and hope they would describe my leadership style as both collaborative and decisive. I think that um, my goal and focus is to empower the people actually doing the work so that they feel supported protected. Um, I think the one of my own 
guides as a supervisor or leader is that um, successes are for the people doing the work and mistakes or failures are my responsibility. And I think that um, you communicate that to your people by how, um, how you run the organization that you're the leader of and it frees them to do their best work. So one more question and I wanna hand it off to Chair Torres. Uh, Councilman Rolander and Councilman Williams were instrumental before I was elected to the City Council in passing some very significant uh, police reform and accountability measures. One of those measures created a, a, an IG, an Inspector General for the NYPD, which falls under the purview of the Department of Investigation. Not all of the IGs in the city that report to uh, the commissioner were created by the city council, but this position was, and it was a fight. Uh, during the time I wasn't here for it, they could describe it, as could other members more accurately. Um, but what I read, and again, I, I don't know if this is true, I've read that uh, the current inspector general, his name was removed off of reports, and Commissioner Peter's name was put on those reports to make it sort of seem like it was all Commissioner Peter's and less about some of the work that the IG was doing. And I want to understand the, the level of independence that inspector generals would have, both ones that were created by the city council and ones that were not created by the city council. What level of independence would they have in doing the work that the charter and that a local law gives them authority to do? And how would you interface with those different inspector generals uh, that would fall under your leadership? So I, I think that um, as a general leadership matter, that if you were the commissioner of DOI, that you're ultimately responsible for the quality and um, integrity of the work that is produced by anyone who reports to you. I think that's a very different matter than seeking personal recognition for the work that other people are doing. Um, the NYPD IG in particular, if I understand correctly, was created with the, with the concept, with the idea that it would have some measure of independence from DOI and would function differently than the IGs that form um, the historical part of DOI. And I think that given the unique role that NYPD IG was designed to fill, that that's appropriate. Um, I also don't know all the details. I, I know some of the things that you alluded to and from what I read in the papers, um, as well as some disputes over budget and staffing and who people report to. M my sense as a leader is that decisions about staffing and budget should be driven by the mission of the particular unit. So um, if the the NYPD IG has a, has a mission and a workload and work requirements that are different from some of the other IGs at DOI and that might require different kinds of staffing, different resources. So to me, the, the measure is what is required to fulfill the mission, um, not what is best for Margaret Garnett. Do you think it's appropriate to remove uh, IG's names off of reports that they were deeply involved in or that they ran the investigation on? No. Okay, I have more questions later, but I wanna turn it uh, to Chair Torres, uh, who has some questions. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Garnett. I look forward to asking you some further questions after additional colleagues have time to ask important questions. Thank you. Thank you. How are you, Ms. Garnett? Hi. Um, I'm sure the rain is by no means an omen of things to come. I uh, hope not. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I had the opportunity to meet you. I will say just a, just a quick review of your resume suggests you're exceptionally qualified for to be DOI commissioner. My interactions suggest that you're impressively well-tempered, likable, so no one can possibly question the professionalism of the, of the choice that the mayor has made. Thank you. I want to preface my questioning with some opening remarks and then I'll, I'll get right into the questioning. You're being considered for one of the most important positions in city government. Right? There's no oversight institution in city government that possesses the investigative reach and resources of DOI. Right? You're the only commissioner who has oversight over every city agency 
and every city official on matters both criminal and operational. You have at your disposal hundreds of investigators embedded in every agency with access to internal documents, information, communications. You have the authority not only to investigate agencies but also private individuals and institutions that do business with the city or otherwise receive a benefit from the city, which is a limitless universe. In fact, Amazon could be the latest company to fall within <laughs> DOI's orbit. So simply put, the breadth and depth of DOI's power is without match in city government. And I believe that a city that cannot administer elections, cannot pick up the snow, or cannot provide safe and decent affordable housing to a half a million New Yorkers is a city that needs an aggressive and proactive watchdog at the helm of DOI. So the question for me is not whether DOI has the capacity to be aggressive and proactive. It does. The question is how aggressive and proactive are you going to be? And that's going to guide the questions that I ask you. You spoke earlier about the appearance and substance of independence from all public officials, including the mayor. Did anyone in the mayor's team play a role in preparing you for today's hearing? Yes. Okay. Who in the mayor's team prepared you? Um, I, I hope they'll forgive me for not remembering their names, but um, I would say a hand, uh, Jeff Lynch, who's the mayor's city legislative. Never heard of him. <laughs> um, so um, Ms. Clutter and some people from her team at appointments, and um, Mr. Lynch and some people from his team at, at City Legislative Affairs, and someone from the press office. And what has been the extent of your interactions with the mayor? Um, I spoke to the mayor for about 30 minutes during the week prior to uh, my nomination being announced on the phone. I met with him in person at Gracie Mansion um, for a uh, it was a lengthy interview, about two hours that week. Um, and then I actually ran into him on the street um, on a Saturday outside the Y. I was picking up my daughter from her swimming lesson, and the mayor was coming out, and we chatted for about 10 minutes on the sidewalk. That's great. And, and during those interactions, did the mayor convey to you his, his expectations of you as DOI commissioner? Um, yes. I mean, we talked about my background. We talked about... Um, he, he said that he expected the, that DOI would continue to be independent, that he also expected me to have, um, it was important to have professional relationships with this council, with city agencies, with other law enforcement partners, and we mostly talked about my background um, and my professional experience. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the, the proper role of DOI, right? I think DOI could serve as a largely reactive institution, responding to isolated complaints and cases of fraud, corruption, or abuse, or it can take on a broader oversight role, right? proactively investigating mismanagement, operational failures in city agencies. Uh, which role do you envision for DOI? I think both of those roles are, are important, and really one relates to the other. I, I think DOI's role as a criminal investigator, even though, of course, all of those investigations won't ultimately result in criminal charges, is very important. And, and much of that work, not, certainly not all, but, but much of it will be reactive to whistleblower complaints, complaints from citizens, um, tips or requests from the council or from other parts of city government, including the administration. Um, and that work is very important, I think, um, a number of people have touched on the fact that DOI is very powerful, and I think it is important for the dignity of public service and for the confidence that the citizens of New York have in their government that DOI remain active in that role of rooting out wrongdoing. But I think uniquely in my experience among um, criminal investigative agencies, DOI also has this very, um, to me, a very attractive ability to not just think about cases, but think more broadly about problems in the city and to use their vantage point largely drawn from um, investigations of specific instances of waste or fraud or abuse to see the bigger picture, to identify instances where systemic change is needed or where there's been gross mismanagement, waste um, or, or fraud or abuse of the public's trust. So, I don't see that a choice between those two is required. Rather, I think both roles are important yeah. and they, um, they're complementary of each other. I agree with you. Um, 
correct me if I'm wrong, it seems to me, even though you have a wealth of experience as a prosecutor, there's some, there seems to be something uniquely daunting about the role of a DOI commissioner in this sense, that your role is essentially to investigate the administration whose head appointed you, whose head could fire you. Um, as far as I know, I know that you obviously the, the Attorney General you know, could obviously investigate the President under special <laughs> circumstances, but does not investigate executive agencies with regularity, right? The, the Attorney General of New York does not investigate gubernatorial agencies with regularity, whereas DOI investigates mayoral agencies with regularity. That's a uniquely, have you ever been in that kind of situation before where you have to investigate the administration whose head has the power to fire you? Um. I'm sorry, I'm hesitating only because I, I want to make sure that I don't say anything about any investigations that I can't yeah. speak about publicly. Um, I think it is certainly true that the U.S. Attorney's Office has the ability to conduct criminal investigations that could touch on um, members of the federal government, and in my time in office that certainly occurred. Um, same thing at the Attorney General's Office. that we have the ability to investigate other members of state government and have done so, including people at gubernatorial agencies or, or connected to the governor. So as a general matter, yes, I think I have been in situations where that's possible. I, I agree that structurally DOI is, is different in that that is its primary mission. And are you confident that, I guess, how do you, and this is a tough question to answer the abstract. You never know until you're actually in this situation. But how do you not allow yourself to be deterred by the risk or the threat of political re retaliation that constantly hangs over an agency like DOI? So uh, I certainly have experience with standing pressure and criticism um, and keeping my focus on doing the right thing um, based on the facts and the law. Um, I, I could give dozens of examples of that through my career as a prosecutor. I think in this specific instance, um, I don't have a great concern. I'm not a political person. I have no political ambitions. I think um, far more important to me is my reputation as a prosecutor for integrity, fairness, professionalism. Um, I, I think I would, I would much sooner risk being fired than risk damaging my professional reputation. So I, I, um, I have not been in the situation where someone threatened to fire me if I did X, Y, or Z. Um, but I can tell you that I have no hesitation that if I was faced with a choice of doing what I thought was right or being fired, I know which one I would choose. Now, you're familiar with the tenure of Commissioner Mark Peters, I suspect. You're familiar with the kind of investigations he's undertaken, the kind of reports he's written. <coughs> Is that fair to say? Uh, in a general way, yes. So based on your own knowledge of, of how DOI operated under his leadership, was, was Commissioner Peters too aggressive, in your opinion? Um, too aggressive in the substance? Uh, not at, at, at investigating operational failures, mismanagement in, in mayoral agencies? No. No, okay. Good. And I guess when it comes to investigating those kind of cases, how will your approach differ from your predecessors? Um, th that's hard for me to say because I don't know what his approach was in directing the investigations. Um, what I can say is that under my leadership that the DOI will follow the facts wherever they lead, that in any situation in which we have credible information about corruption or wrongdoing, um, that that would merit, that would be a proper subject of DOI investigation and that the path of that investigation would be governed by the facts and the evidence and no other consideration. Now the investigations you conduct, the oversight investigations often result in recommendations and reforms regarding the operations of an agency, and many of those reforms are agreed upon right. between DOI and the applicable agency. Are, are you willing to commit to tracking whether agencies are complying with those agreed upon recommendations and the extent to which those agencies are complying with those recommendations? Um, I guess it depends what you mean by tracking. I think that it is difficult. Certainly some reports might result in the appointment of a monitor for a particular agency. Um, of various kinds, and in that case, those cases, a there'd be a monitor in place and that person would report to DOI. Um, I think that DOI is not itself a monitor. It's, it's not 
that's not its um, expertise. So I do think that it's important, and I confess I haven't given a lot of thought to the mechanism for doing it, that where DOI has made recommendations and there have been commitments from the agencies to carry those out, that there would be an ongoing oversight function that would assess whether those things are being implemented. So, so you would perform that function of monitoring whether there has been implementation of agreed upon recommendations? Yes, I think that's important. I, I don't know what exactly the mechanism would be, but the concept I agree with, yes. And since the city council has an oversight function over city agencies, would you commit to briefing the city council or relevant committees about whether agencies are implementing faithfully agreed upon recommendations? Um, yes, I think that there certainly will be situations where um, there will be barriers to disclosing information that is known to DOI, whether to the council, to the administration, to the public. Um, but where appropriate, I think that it can be valuable to share that information with the community. And by barriers, you mean legal barriers? or Right, legal barriers or investigative right. concerns, yes. Right. Like, are there investigative concerns beyond legal barriers? Um, yes, sometimes that even though there might, there might be information that's not um, grand jury information or technically barred from disclosure, that there would be legitimate law enforcement or investigative reasons why at a given point in time, it wasn't appropriate to disclose that information. If it derailed the investigation or undercut right, the investigation. Right, if it okay, that's the a fair point. Um, if you are confirmed, as, as you likely will be, and I'm revisiting questions that were posed earlier, but I, I think there's some question about what your confirmation will mean for the investigations undertaken by your predecessor. Uh, my understanding is that in DOI, there's something known as the executive dashboard, which is essentially an internal list of approximately the 20 most consequential investigations. And these are said to be investigations that are likely to result in a report, about 95% of them do. Uh, if you decide, for whatever reason, to discontinue an investigation on the executive dashboard or decline to publish the findings from one of those investigations on the dashboard, Will you let the city council know? I can't commit to doing that. I, I, I think it will depend greatly on what the reasons were for a decision not to issue a report or to close an investigation. Um, what I can say is that no, um, the only consideration in making that decision will be the facts and the evidence and the viability of um, the charges if it's a criminal investigation or the evidence and facts that we have to issue a report that's on the oversight side. I guess I'm curious to know, because it would seem to me you have, the council has a right to know, right? We have an oversight function over city agencies and I see it as the role of DOI to ensure that we have enough information to effectively oversee agencies. And the public has a right to know. So like what is setting aside criminal law enforcement, which has its own requirements for confidentiality. There's no one here who's interested in knowing what criminal investigations DOI is conducting. But when it comes <laughs> to the oversight function, what, what is the public's right to know? What's the city council's right to know? What are the limits of those rights as you see them? Setting aside criminal law enforcement, we all understand that's an exception. Okay, so um, setting that aside, that's yes. I think my, my largest reservation, I think and the reason I say this is because there is an article in BuzzFeed today that suggests that a DOI shelved a report about misconduct on the part of officers in the NYPD, and that's the greatest fear I have, is that there are investigations that have been undertaken, but the, neither the public nor the city council will ever find out about the results of those investigations. And so what is our right to know and what are the limits? Um, I. I would imagine, I don't know this for sure, but I would imagine that there are many, um, DOI is undertaking investigations based on uh, complaints from the citizens, tips from city council, from agency heads, from the administration, from a wide variety of sources, as I think is true many law enforcement agencies. Um, I assume that many of those inquiries do not pan out or that it is, a decision is made that um, essentially, there's nothing to see here, right? There's no, it doesn't rise to the level of issuing a report, um, no criminal charges should be brought, a look was taken and a decision is made based on what the evidence is that no further action is needed. 
um, given the breadth of DOI's responsibilities, I would imagine that happens hundreds of times a year. I don't think that it serves the public interest or this council's oversight function um, to have an endless stream of disclosure that we received a tip about X and we looked and decided there was nothing there. Um, but I'm referring to the, I agree, there's some investigations that go nowhere. And but what about the investigations that bear fruit? Can you imagine a circumstance under which there's an investigation that bears fruit, but you would nevertheless decline to either notify the city council or publish the investigative findings? No. Okay. So if an investigation bore fruit, you have a reporting obligation to the public and to the council? Yes. Okay. You are unique among commissioners in the sense that you are nominated by the mayor, but you are confirmed to the city council. So there's a sense in which you have obligations to both the executive and the legislature, reporting obligations. Do you see those obligations as equivalent, or do you think you're more, you have a greater reporting obligation to the mayor or to the council? How do you envision your reporting obligations? Um, I see those as equivalent. I don't think that there's, I think the mayor and the city council are you know, co-equal branches of city government, obviously, in New York, we have a, a strong mayoral system um, with a lot of control over city agencies, but um, the council plays a very important role in city government. So as far as DOI's obligations and the goal, which is improving city government and city services, um, I don't see a difference between um, the council and the mayor on that front, no. And I see the investigative function of DOI as, a, as, as complementary to the oversight function of the city council we both have a shared mission of investigating and overseeing city agencies, public benefit corporations. As commissioner, would you see the council as an institutional partner in reforming the operations of city agencies? Yes, I think, I think particularly on the oversight side, there's a lot of potential for fruitful collaboration. I have a question I'll, I'm gonna share with you an experience I had uh, with the housing authority. Um, the, the former chair of the housing authority submitted erroneous testimony to the city council about NYCHA's lead safety program. And that's something we would have never found out but for a letter from DOI informing us. So, so if, if you come to discover that a government official submitted to the city council testimony that is untrue, inaccurate, or incomplete in any way, do you feel you have an obligation to inform the council? Um, it, certainly if information is untrue, I, I would consider that a very serious breach of the public trust. Um, and I, I mean, I could imagine situations where that is, could support a criminal investigation, which might delay any- it, Setting aside the possible. criminal, yes. Um, but yeah, I think if DOI has information that a city official gave untruthful testimony to the council, that the council should be notified by, that, uh, by DOI. Um, again, assuming there's no need for confidentiality for other reasons. Um, I, I think that it starts to get more fact dependent and more complicated once you move down the spectrum to um, incomplete or uh, not fully forthcoming. I think that's more of a judgment call, but certainly I can imagine situations on that spectrum where I would feel an obligation to notify the council that we had information that suggested that. Um, as, a, as a general proposition? Yes. Okay. I have more questions, but I wanna give my colleagues an opportunity, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I had, <coughs> excuse me, I had three questions, but they were already in. So I want to uh, acknowledge Council Members Mark Traeger and Council Member Jamani Williams. And now I'd like to call Madam on Madam Chair, may I just ask one, one quick question? Yes. Uh, uh, Ms. Garnett, have you volunteered on any political campaigns in the past? Um, the only, the only thing was in, um, in 2004, my husband and I on election day did some get out the vote work for John Kerry in Pennsylvania. Um, other than that, no. And have you made political contributions to anyone who is currently in city office? In New York City office? In New York City office. No. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Council Member Adams. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Mr. Garnett. Thank you, Ms. Garnett. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, your testimony so far has been exceptional in my opinion. Uh, and the fact that uh, you are here 
seated and hopefully will be concern, uh, confirmed um, is very heartening for me. Uh, personally, so I just wanted to say that. Um, my, my colleague, um, Councilmember Torres, as well as the speaker, spoke about some items that uh, are of concern to me as well regarding your predecessor. Um, it's been reported that former Commissioner Peters restricted the authority and tied the hands of the Inspector General, the NYPD Inspector General, regarding police misconduct and instances of being untruthful uh, in office statements. My concern regarding the Inspector General, uh, as is, I believe, my colleagues here on the panel today, is the role of the NYPD Inspector General and how critical that role is. There is already a perception in the public that there are no consequences for bad behavior. Um, by police officers, and it's not just New York, it's across the country, it's, an, it's a national problem. So when we find out that uh, a leader um, that has been put into place by the city council, uh, that that leadership is somehow being usurped by another in charge is extremely, uh, number one, it's baffling, and number two, it's extremely disturbing. How are you going to protect that office uh, of NYPD Inspector General? Um, how are you going to ensure confidence in that individual and the role um, that is so needed with regard to police behavior, um, with a public perception, uh, and with the overall responsibility of the NYPD Inspector? Um, so I don't know all the facts of the situations we're referring to, but I, I certainly share the conceptual concerns about um, the need for the NYPD IG to be able to fulfill the role that the council envisioned for that, um, for that position. So um, I don't know, Mr. Ewer, and of course I haven't had an opportunity yet to meet with any of the um, senior staff, but I think the first place to begin is for me to sit down and meet with him and um, hear what his concerns are and hear from him whether there are ways he feels he's been constrained and start to understand more of what may or may not have gone on in the past. I think for me the only relevant standard um, for the issuance of DOI reports is are they truthful um, and do they meet the highest professional standards. I, I don't think other considerations are, are relevant to that decision. So um, I think that if that has gone on in the past, that would be very troubling, and I would want to get an understanding of, of what has happened and whether there are things that ought to be done now to, to correct that. Thank you very much. Uh, also, just to, um, I, I guess, maybe reiterate something that the speaker referenced with regard to whistle whistleblowers mm -hmm. and the protection of whistleblowers. Um, one thing that we don't want is to uh, tamper um, uh, whistleblowers coming forward. We want to continue to produce confidence um, by the job that we are doing and by the job that our agencies are doing so that we can encourage people to come up and speak out uh, often and always uh, about misconduct uh, that is going on around, around them. Um, how do you see your role uh, w as it pertains to whistleblowers and, um, and the provision of information um, coming from whistleblowers? Um, so I think uh, first that maintaining the independence and integrity and reputation for independence and integrity of DOI is really important to that. Whistleblowers will only come forward if they have confidence that um, the information they're bringing to DOI's attention is going to be investigated professionally, driven only by what the facts are, um, and that and that they will be protected from retaliation. Um, so I think that any commissioner of DOI should want to encourage city employees um, or people who work for entities that receive city money to come forward with knowledge they have about wrongdoing or um, mismanagement or, or fraud. And so you have to give people, the, in, in everything you do, even unrelated investigations, um, act in a way that gives people confidence that um, their, that their identity will be protected for as long as possible, that they'll be protected from retaliation, and that their complaints will be investigated professionally and fairly. 
So I think that's globally is the most important thing. Um, as I said uh, in response to Speaker Johnson's question, I don't know all the ins and outs of the city's whistleblower statute. I, I certainly think that um, if the staff at DOI or myself as commissioner felt that that statute needed to be changed or improved or strengthened to um, protect whistleblowers, that it would be appropriate to bring those concerns to the council. Thank you very much. I yield to my colleagues. Councilmember Chen. Thank you, Chair. Um, Ms. Garnett, good afternoon. And as I'm really proud to see a highly qualified woman being nominated for this position. Thank the mayor for that. Um, and thank you for your testimony and, uh, and your insight into this role uh, for, the, for the commissioner of department investigation. I just wanted to follow up in terms of some of the issues that we might be able to get um, the department of investigation um, to investigate, to pay attention to you. And, <laughs> especially like in my district, for example. Um, the public really have lost confidence in government because of some of these rampant issues that's been going on. For example, like placard parking. We're overrun by it, and the city's not enforcing it enough. And people are violating the law, and every day I hear from my constituents that they've lost trust in government, that we have not done something um, to really um, stop this issue. Um, another one in my district, and something that we have no control over, is this whole proliferation of social adult daycare in the city. There are more of them than senior centers that are funded by the city. And meanwhile, they're taking government Medicaid dollars, and they're not really doing what they're supposed to do. And the Department for the Aging don't have the official oversight. But we know for a fact that a lot of them are violating the law and taking advantage uh, of elderly New Yorkers. And the third one, which is also in my district, Speaker, <laughs> proliferation of counterfeit goods. People buying and selling on the street, especially during the weekend and holidays. I mean, they're just out there. And there's... <coughs> There's got to be some way of stopping this. They're not paying taxes. They're violating the law. They get arrested. They come back out. And we could not get the district attorney's office to really work with us to find some creative ideas to sort of stop these kind of illegal activity that's taking over our street. And New Yorkers are losing confidence in government. So I wanted to hear from you how we can work together um, to take care of some of these issues uh, so that we can build back the confidence from our citizens. Um, so I, I think that part of the design of DOI is that among the places where um, the DOI can get direction for investigations or requests for investigation is from the city council. And I think that um, it's, it's unquestioned. DOI is a very powerful agency and has access to many sources of information. But um, one area where it, it is by far inferior to the council is how much access you have to constituent concerns and to how citizens of New York experience city government and city government services. So I think that information um, is unique to the council and is a potentially very valuable source of information for DOI and its oversight function. So I look forward to collaborating with the council on, on those issues. Um, I can't really speak to the specific issues that you've raised because I just don't have the information, but um, it is interesting on counterfeit goods, um, the, the penalties, as I'm sure you've learned, the criminal penalties are very low. Uh, in the, at the U.S. Attorney's Office, we did a number of these kinds of cases. The penalties are very low and probably not much of a deterrent, um, as you've said. Um, I think one advantage GOI has, as I mentioned earlier, is that it's not limited to just thinking about individual criminal cases, but also can take a broader view from a collection of potential criminal investigations to work with other agencies on systemic reform. So I don't have the answers sitting here today to those things, but um, I think that they're 
important issues for how city residents experience their government and um, I look forward to working um, with you or other council members on those issues. Thank you, and I look forward to working with you on them too. Thank you. Council Member Traeger. Thank you very much, Chair, and congratulations on your nom nomination. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions here. Uh, so, and forgive me if, if this might have been asked earlier or if you answered this earlier, just to, just to kind of refresh my memory. So how did you become aware of this opportunity to become commissioner of DOI? Um, so exactly two weeks ago from today, um, a colleague of mine told me that he'd been asked for my cell phone number by Joni Clutter, who's the Mayor's Appointments Council, and that he'd given it to her and I should expect her to call me and that he thought it was about um, DOI. And I spoke to her later that evening and that's the first um, that I heard about uh, that I was being considered possibly to be nominated as commissioner of DOI. So for just a few weeks ago, someone... Two weeks ago from today. It's been, <laughs> it's been a whirlwind, yes. Well, happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, and and um, who did you consult with about this position before taking the job? Um, I talked to my husband. Um, I spoke to uh, the judge that I clerked for, who's uh, now a federal judge on the Second Circuit. Um, he's been an incredible mentor for me and source of advice, so uh, I really value his perspective. Um, I spoke to the Attorney General um, and to some of the other senior staff at the Attorney General's office. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to get now to the, to the council. Um, I know this, this might sound like a very easy question, but this is an important question to this council, particularly in, to what's happened in recent years. How important is it for city officials to be truthful to the city council during our committee hearings? Uh, vitally important. I mean, I think the council has an important oversight role um, that depends on truthful testimony. And I think maybe more importantly even than that, that um, government officials who are not truthful are um, that's a violation of the public's trust, um, even more so than um, making this council's oversight role more difficult. Yeah, I, I appreciate uh, that answer because there have been some really unfortunate moments in recent years. Uh, my colleagues mentioned before <coughs> the issue about NYCHA lead testing. And I recall an exchange I had with an administration official about children being tested for lead in NYCHA. And I was repeatedly told by the administration that the city is a national leader on the issue. And if, if it was not for the wonderful reporting of the press, because the press did an outstanding job, uh, they uncovered through FOIL requests and through other means that there were, in fact, numerous children poisoned with lead living in public housing. But again, this, this council was told that we're a national leader. And so I could tell you that there has been uh, significant breaches of trust between the administration and the council that has to be healed and repaired in order for us to conduct effective oversight, in order for us to effectively serve the people that we're sworn to serve. We can't solve problems if we're not honest about them. And that's what we're here for. Um, are you familiar with any systemic investigations, and the key word is systemic investigations of the New York City Department of Education in recent years? Um, no. Neither am I. Neither am I. Uh, I am the chair of the Education Committee in the New York City Council, and I am not familiar with uh, any city-led systemic investigation. There's been investigation of personnel matters, which are important, but I can't point to a systemic investigation, the ones that we have seen with NYCHA and lead testing. The DOE is the largest city department. When you, add, when you combine pension costs, it's over $30 billion. It's over a third of our budget. And I've been in the council now, this is my fifth year, I can't point to one. But the federal government is not waiting for us. 
because I'm reading in the press that there, there's a federal investigation of the Office of Pupil, Tra uh, Pupil Transportation, OPT, over the school bus issue. I, I held a hearing on that issue. And w a, a week or so later, I read, read a report that the federal government is now investigating. Uh, I am reading in the papers as well that there's a back and forth between the city and state over the issue of the, the yeshiva inquiry, that it took over three years for the city to conclude that they couldn't enter some schools, and some schools are doing okay, and some schools have to do better. And I'm reading again in the press that there was an active inquiry within DOI about this issue. So I believe we have a lot of work to do, critical work to do. I do believe restoring faith and trust in government is critical. I believe that we must have an honest, open, transparent uh, process here. And uh, you know, I, I do wish you much success uh, in your office. I appreciate your answers about the importance of independence because we have to be here for the right reasons. We're here for the right reasons. And so I congratulate you once again on your nomination, and I look forward to working together. And I thank the chair for her time. Thank you. <coughs> thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, Ms. Garnett, welcome. I agree with the speaker and my colleagues that uh, both your resume and your performance today suggest uh, the temperament and, and experience uh, that we are looking for. Um, I was pleased to learn you are a constituent. We have not met before, and I haven't run into you in front of the Y yet, but uh, <laughs> I'm glad you're here. Um, I do want to focus a little more, as a couple of my colleagues had, on the Office of the NYPD Inspector General. Obviously, there are many other agencies that are critical in the function of DOI, uh, but in 2013, uh, this council passed Local Law 70, sponsored by Councilmember Jamani Williams and me, establishing that office at DOI before that there was no NYPD Inspector General. Um, and we chose to locate it at DOI for a number of reasons, because of the dual reporting to the council as well as well the mayor, because of the independent subpoena power, because of the tradition of integrity and independence, all things we wanted. Um, but it has a somewhat different function from many of the other inspectors general because the NYPD has IAB for cases of individual wrongdoing. We were really looking for something that would focus more on pattern and practice issues, on civil rights issues, on issues of systemic uh, problems and discrimination. Um, and, wrong, um, and that means a, a stronger public facing role, less reliant potentially on, on whistleblowers, um, more policy analysis, um, in addition to the ability to do the thorough investigations. And I will say for the most part, that office got stood up in 2014, and I'll give credit here to the mayor and to former Commissioner Peters, and especially to Inspector General Phil Ewer. They stood that office up for the most part with uh, meeting the goals and vision that this council had for it in some really hard-hitting reports have been accomplished on use of force, on the Special Victims Division that have achieved significant oversight and change at the NYPD. Um, at the same time, uh, especially in recent days, there's these issues of concern that have come up. The speaker referred to the issues around uh, the website, staffing, budget. Uh, Councilmember Adams spoke to concerns, and, and Councilmember Torres as well highlighted in this BuzzFeed article today about whether uh, a couple of reports were shelved, both one about officer lying and one that Councilmember Williams and I have requested looking at the gang database. Um, and I do think it's important to lift up here some allegations of concern raised in uh, Mark Peters' letter uh, related to the question of cooperation from the NYPD and situations where he may have sought it and either did not receive the materials or cooperation necessary and City Hall may not have backed him up there. And then in some ways a very troubling one, these issues surrounding um, uh, Deputy Chief Osgood, uh, who played a role in giving information to DOI for the Special Victims Division report and concerns that his uh, transfer, you know, or I guess I it read as a demotion out of that unit, appear like they are uh, potentially retaliation for whistleblowing, obviously something that would be very troubling for all the reasons that you've talked about. So I guess I just wonder if, you know, first can you say a little more about how you see the police oversight function 
um, and what you would look to do as DOI commissioner in relationship to the NYPD Inspector General's office. And then I guess I just want to ask about a couple of those specifics uh, as well. Okay. So, um, you know, I think as, as you said, the, a big part of why the NYPD IG is so um, different from other parts of DOI is because unlike really any other agency that I'm familiar with in city government, um, the NYPD IAB takes on a large portion of the work that um, that DOI would do for many other city agencies in terms of individual instances of, of wrongdoing, whether they result in criminal charges or internal discipline. Um, and so, as I understand it, the NYPD IG is, um, as you said, has a much a, a different role, a much more externally facing role um, in trying to be a intermediary between the communities that are pol that are policed in the city um, and the way that the police department functions in terms of policies, practices, training. Um, I think in in the last year in my with my involvement in our special investigations and prosecutions unit, there's some quite a bit of overlap, I think, between some of the work that SIP does and the work of the NYPD IG in that part of the mandate for SIP is not only to investigate instances of um, deaths in police custody or at the hands of the police statewide, but also, very importantly, to produce public reports that um, are transparent as to what the evidence was in the investigation. Um, the legal analysis driving any decision about what charges are possible, if any, or warranted. Um, and then most importantly, recommend any recommendations for systemic changes, whether for that particular department or for law enforcement in the state more generally. So I think there's a lot of overlap between what I've learned in this past year in the work of SIP and what the NYPD IG does. And I think, look, we're very lucky as New Yorkers to have um, a really outstanding, professional, sophisticated police department that I think is the envy of many other cities in the country. But there's room for improvement, uh, you know, in every agency, but in policing in particular, given how important it is and how much power and influence they can have over the lives of New Yorkers. So I think we should justifiably be proud of the police department. But there's no question that there's room for improvement and that it is valuable to have an independent, person and staff that is outside of the police department and engaged with a broader debate around policing in this country um, to, to be involved in making those recommendations and pressing for, for necessary reform. So I think um, it's a very important role and I look forward to meeting Mr. Ewer and talking to him about um, the operation of his office. Thank you. I think that reflects the balance we feel as well. We, of course, appreciate the role that the NYPD plays in creating the inspector general where it didn't exist was not a vote of the opposite of a vote of no confidence. I think you say it just right. We, we want it made, as, made better, made as good as it can possibly be. Three just specific questions. One on, cooper on this issue of cooperation. Um, every agency resists investigation, like all human beings, I think, would resist, and, you know, so... Um, but if there are instances, as I'm sure there will be, where um, you need cooperation in getting documents, materials, individuals to speak, um, and there is resistance, I guess from any agency, but since it's been raised specifically around the PD, um, how will you handle it, that balance between wanting cooperation through <coughs> relationship building, but when necessary, being willing to use your subpoena power, and if there are times when you don't get an adequate level of cooperation, can we have your commitment that you will let us know that and that things won't just wind up uh, buried for lack of cooperation without any ability for us to you know, have a sense of what's taking place? Um, yes, I think, look, I think eight, all agencies, including the NYPD, have an obligation to cooperate with DOI's investigations and a failure to do so or act of obstruction or resistance is, is really a dereliction of the public's trust and confidence in those leaders. So I, I think that any response to resistance um, or lack of cooperation has to be calibrated to the circumstances. So there's a range of possible responses, starting with you know, a direct conversation between the commissioner and the relevant agency head, 
potentially involving um, other parts of city government, whether that be city hall or this council, the appropriate committee or um, council members who have oversight over that part of city government. Subpoena power, of course, exposing a lack of cooperation in a public report, um, and in under very egregious circumstances, potentially, you know, recommending uh, criminal charges for obstruction. I think that I, I hope that would be a rare and very extreme of measure, course. but um, certainly is is possible. So I think there's a range of tools and responses that would be have to be calibrated to what the factual circumstances were. Thank you. On the two investigations around uh, officers who may have lied under oath and around the gang database, can we have your commitment to look into those uh, two issues which have been raised and uh, figure out what the appropriate next steps are without knowing what they are today? Um, those seem like two things that we, you know, I, I hope you'll look into and would like your commitment that you'll look into them and take the actions you deem appropriate. Uh, yes, I, I assume, again, from what I read in the paper, I only know what I read in the papers. Um, I, I do still read a paper newspaper. I'm maybe one of the last few. Um, but certainly my first, one of the first orders of business will be to meet with the heads of each part of DOI, including Mr. Yor, and get a sense of what his concerns are, what's in the hopper, um, and anything that he is looking at, I would like to get up to speed on and make sure that we're taking appropriate steps to move it forward. And we'd like to hear, you know, to the extent that there isn't something that requires confidentiality, a report back from you on that, on the gang database. We've requested that investigation and we're eager to see it move forward. And obviously if there's something there on the issue of lying, that's important. And then finally, on this question of Chief Osgood, who sat here in this room when the council had a very thorough hearing chaired by uh, Councilmember Rickert Richards, who chairs our Public Safety Committee, and, and Councilmember Torres, it seems pretty straightforward that he played a role in cooperating with DOI in a way that provided critical, shined a light on critical issues and led to significant change that needed to happen. And now he has been transferred out of that unit. I don't know what happened internally, but one has to, it, it certainly raises questions about whistleblowing, cooperation with DOI, and whatever the individual circumstances, it's important from a public point of view for people to have the confidence to cooperate. So I guess there as, as well, I'm asking the same. Can we have your commitment to, to look into what happened there uh, and as you then deem appropriate, developing a, a plan for what the action is that's appropriate coming out of your, of your look into that situation? Yeah, I certainly share your concern that if any city employee of whatever rank is retaliated against because of their cooperation with DOI, that would be very troubling and, and unacceptable to me. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I certainly, am, I, I, again, read the news reports about Chief Osgood being transferred to a different command. Um, so I don't know the facts, but um, I think to the extent there's any credible information that some a city employee was retaliated against for cooperating with DOI, that, that would absolutely merit us looking into it. Can we just have your commitment on this one to look into it, uh, whether he comes forward and alleges that he's a whistleblower or not, given the elevation in the in the public? Um, I think, I, I guess I would like your commitment that you're gonna look into what happened in that situation. That may not mean opening a full investigation unless there's information that merits it, but m more than waiting for him to come forward and identify himself as a potential whistleblower. Oh, I, yeah, I, I don't think that looking into it would require waiting for him to come forward. And um, I certainly think that that's something that I would raise with Mr. Yor and, and get more information about, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Speaker. Just some quick questions and then I want to get to, on to the other colleagues. I just want to reiterate something that uh, Councilmember Lander just said. Uh, I think it's, uh, Councilmember Lander said it, I have very serious concerns as well about the gang database, about predominantly young men of color uh, being caught up in a database that um, they <laughs> may not, uh, that, that they shouldn't be in. Um, and uh, we have requested an investigation from uh, DOI into this. And uh, again, I would just like, given the importance for members of this body, to understand your commitment to looking into that for us and reporting back on it. Yes. Great. Uh, similarly, I agree with what Councilmember Lander just said on Chief Osgood and the great work and cooperation involved in shining the light on the Special Victims Division. Uh, so thank you for that. There was a, there was a, 
question for pre-hearing questions, and it's question 2B. And the question was, how would you respond to a request by City Hall to pull or stop an investigation? Now, we asked about this earlier, and your answer was, I would listen to the input of any appropriate stakeholder, including the administration, members of the council, or leadership of the relevant agency. But the sole factor in deciding the outcome of a DOI investigation will be my independent professional judgment in consultation with career staff at DOI. Just want to be very clear. That means that what you, what you were saying in that answer is if a member of the city council, someone in administration, a commissioner, a deputy commissioner uh, sought to interfere or stop an investigation, you would not allow that to happen. You may uh, listen to what that individual has to say, but you are not in any way playing along with people stopping an investigation. I just want to be very clear on this. Yes, that's right. Okay. Um, and then uh, Councilmember Adams asked about, and I asked about strengthening whistleblower protections. I actually think there's more we can do to strengthen whistleblower protections uh, via legislation in the council. And uh, I would love your commitment to be able to work with you and the folks at DOI, the professional staff who deal with whistleblower complaints on working together to strengthen whistleblower protections through a legislative process to provide greater protection for whistleblowers. And I would love um, you to be open to having that conversation. Yes, and I'm sure that the staff at DOI um, will have some ideas of their own about the pro issues they've seen in past investigations, and um, I think we'd you know, be happy to work with the council on any needed improvements or strengthening of that law. And I should have asked this earlier, the Special Commissioner of Investigations, as part of the Department of Education, as the Chair of our Education Committee, uh, Chair Traeger, uh, was talking about earlier, what is your understanding, given everything that transpired and how we got to this moment today, what is your understanding of the independence of that office, the reporting structure from SCI to DOI? Given everything that transpired, what is your understanding of where we stand? Um, so the, the Special Commissioner of Investigation reports to the Commissioner of DOI, but um, again, as with some other things we've talked about today, the design of SCI, as I understand it, was intended and is protected by certain executive orders and other statutory protections to function to some degree independent of sort of core DOI and this, the, uh, this sort of org chart of DOI that flows down from the commissioner. It has its own budget, um, its own obligations. As Council Member Traeger said, the Department of Education is the largest city agency. My own children attend public schools, so um, I have a, a vested interest in, in that, as all New Yorkers should. Um, it, they have their own uh, budget. It's very important that I think they be empowered to do real oversight over the Department of, of Education, which um, has a huge staff, a huge budget, serves, I, I think, the number I saw recently, three million children in the city. Um, and, and so I, I don't know Ms. Coleman. Um, I, I've never met her. I think among my first orders of business, if I'm confirmed as DOI commissioner, will be to, to meet with her and sit down with her individually, um, basically to take her temperature on how she's feeling about all this transpired over the last few months um, and hear from her what she thinks is needed to have um, the recommended reset from the McGovern report between the commissioner's office and SCI and its staff. Would you be open if uh, I have not consulted the uh, legislative council and uh, my council uh, here about this today, but if there was a way to actually codify, not just through previous executive orders that were issued by previous mayors and the subsequent executive order that the mayor issued when this action took place earlier this year, uh, would, do you think that, that the independence, uh, as you just described, of the uh, Special Commissioner's Office of Investigation as part of the Department of Education, should that be codified as we understand it right now so that there is total clarity around that level of independence? Um, truthfully, I don't know enough about the details to have a view on that. I think 
Um, if I'm confirmed, once I get to DOI and learn more about um, what is required and the operation of SCI, I'd be happy to work collaboratively with the council on, on any changes. Right now, I just don't know enough to have an informed view. Thank you very much, Ms. Garnett. I'm gonna have further questions, but I wanna send it back to the chair to call on additional colleagues. Council Member Jonai. Thank you, Chair. Congratulations, uh, Ms. Garnett, on your nomination. Thank you. Uh, the first question that came to mind is, what was the conversation like around Thanksgiving dinner? <laughs> Don't answer that, please. <laughs> um, we obviously <coughs> brought to your attention uh, the importance of having commissioners and agencies testify uh, truthfully and honestly. Um, in the lead paint testimonies and the false testifying that was done before this council, how would you have handled that investigate or how would you have handled such false, misleading, willful testimony? Um, look, I, I think there's no question that um, this council should not tolerate and frankly, no part of city government should tolerate false testimony before this council. I think um, I've, I've prosecuted perjury cases before as a prosecutor, so um, I know how difficult they are to prove criminally. And I think there's also, um, there, there's quite a spectrum and range of sort of intentionally false and perjurious testimony down to mistakes or fa failures of memory. And, and all of those things along that spectrum shouldn't be treated the same. Um, Look, I, I, I do think that part of DOI is a criminal investigative function and holding city officials to um, high standards. And I think to the extent there's testimony that is at the potentially criminal end of the spectrum, that that's worthy of investigation. And you gave an explain, uh, two weeks ago was the first time you were approached. When did you accept the nomination and who did you uh, meet with to accept the nomination in consideration for this position, which is? Um, so at the, at the end of my conversation with the mayor on Thursday at Gracie Mansion, he said, I've, I, I'd like to offer you this job and I'm gonna nominate you um, to be commissioner of DOI if you accept, and I accept it. You didn't give any thought? You didn't say I'd get back to you? Oh, I'd been <laughs> thinking about it um, pretty much nonstop for the preceding three days. Is it concerning to you that the person that is nominating you for this position, requiring the confirmation by the council, can terminate you without the cooperation of the counterpart that confirms your nomination being this body? No. In a, in a November letter to the council, former Commissioner Peters, confirmed that the DOI has an ongoing probe into NYCHA, the NYPD, and an alleged city hall interference in the Department of Education's review of yeshivas. Assuming that these investigations are happening once your appointment is final, will you pledge to not make any changes in the scope of the investigations or make any changes to any lead personnel in charge of these investigations? Um. I think the only changes I would make would be driven by what I learn about what the facts and evidence are, um, the, the, the subject matter or the potential targets of the investigation would play no role in that decision. So you, you would not, you would keep the existing investigation under the leadership ongoing until you were brought up to speed, I would imagine. Right, and I don't, I, I, I don't know I don't know at all who the personnel are that are working on these um, reported investigations, what their nature is, what their status is. Um, so I would need to get there and learn about who, what, what are the investigations, what stage are they at, who are the personnel, um, are those the right resources, the right personnel, um, the right strategy. Um, but any decision that I make on that will be driven only by my own independent judgment as a prosecutor and not anything related to who the targets are. Happy to hear that. And in a perfect world of keeping this very important position independent, um, 
Would you rather see this position be an elected position versus an appointed position? Um, I, I don't have a view on that one way or the other. I've worked in offices for where the principal is appointed and where the principal is elected, and I think it is possible to have an agency that operates with integrity and with an independence under either structure. Um, I have no interest in running for office myself, so um, uh, I guess I'm happy for myself that it's an appointed position. Um, so I, I, I don't think that there's a right answer to that one way or the other. I think it is, it is possible, and I've experienced it myself, to have um, independent professional um, organizations that operate with integrity and fairness on, under, under both models. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Councilmember Torres. Um, a few more questions. Um, so my understanding is under the charter, there are three triggers for a DOI investigation. Right? You have a, ref a referral from the commissioner, <coughs> a referral from the mayor, and a referral from the city council. And it's the third one that's unclear, right? Because what, what exactly qualifies as a referral from the city council? Is it a local law? Is it a resolution? Is it a referral from the speaker? Is it a referral from the investigations chair? Is it a referral from the relevant subject base committee? So I guess how would you interpret what qualifies as a referral from the city council? Um, so I haven't done a study of the, yeah. that provision of the charter, um, but I think there's a, there's, there's a difference between sort of required triggers, right? Like there are the charter provisions are, the DOI is required to open an investigation upon one of those triggers being activated. But um, what I would expect and exists now and would expect to continue under my leadership is that um, DOI doesn't limit itself to only those triggers and in fact opens many investigations um, based on information from civilian complaints, from whistleblowers, from um, individual council members and other parts of city government. And I would expect that to continue and I don't think, um, I think the question that you ask of what is the scope of that charter provision um, would only arise in a situation in which um, we at DOI didn't want to do something or look into something that uh, an individual council member had sent our way. Um, and you could imagine a dispute arising, like is this required or not required? But I, I, I guess I don't expect that situation to arise because I think that a properly functioning investigative agency should take seriously any credible information that it receives regardless of the source and I would expect that to continue. So, so here's a concern. You know, I had a, a great working relationship with your likely predecessor, but I, I, will, be, I will confess to you, it's, it was frustrating the, what I took to be the excessive secrecy of, of DOI, even beyond what I thought was necessary for maintaining an investigation. So the speaker brought up earlier that we made a request for an investigation into gang databases. Mm -hmm. And we could send the request to DOI, but the moment we would inquire about it, the response tends to be the same. We cannot comment on ongoing investigation. So, <laughs> and I understand that, but like how, how am I supposed to hold you accountable for following up on the referrals from the council as an institution, not simply an individual member, but this was a priority for the speaker when the only response the OI gives us is we cannot comment on an investigation. Like there has to be, and maybe you can't answer this now, but there has to be a middle ground. <coughs> um, I think the frustration you identify as a common one um, and is one that um, is maybe an unavoidable feature of interactions with law enforcement agencies. So but I'm I talking about non every oversight investigations. Right, although I think even oversight investigations often unclear at the beginning where the investigation is going to go, whether um, I think certainly seen in, in previous DOI reports, there's quite a range of reporting options from sort of naming and shaming individual people um, to just broadly discussing systemic changes. So um, I think it is a tension and, and I, 
I regret to say is a tension that will probably continue to some degree yeah. uh, if I become DOI commissioner. Um, but I do hope that we can have you know, productive and professional conversations. But, but let, me, let me challenge you for a moment. Sure. Even the CIA <laughs> and the FBI will provide confidential briefings to Congress. So why can't DOI do the same to the city council under agreed upon circumstances of confidentiality? We often find out about your investigative findings, DOI's investigative findings, the day the report becomes public. How do we change that? Um, I don't know, but I, I, I think, you know, I'm, this, this is very- I'm gonna be a thorn on your side. This sure. is my greatest <laughs> frustration with DOI. I look forward to it. Um, as I said, I think I'm, I, I mean, I don't think, I'm, I'm happy to have those conversations about how we can improve that relationship. I, I don't wanna commit to any particular mechanism to do that today. I just don't know enough about how it could or should work. Um, but I think that, that conversation, that push-pull um, is an important one and one that should happen. And, and I, I expect you to be a thorn in my side. And, and to the extent that I did was aware of some details, it was often based on a personal relationship, right? And I don't think that's the right, it shouldn't be ad hoc. There should be a formal reporting structure between the city council and DOI that outlasts your tenure, my tenure, the speaker's tenure. Is that something that you're willing to work with us to build? I think it's certainly a conversation I'm willing to have. I just don't know enough today about how it should work or could work, but I think that I'm certainly open to hearing the council's concerns and talking about um, ways we can work together that would be more satisfying to the council while still protecting DOI's mission. And I just wanna briefly, uh, is, is Council Member Traeger, did Council Member Traeger ask questions about FBI? Or? I asked some questions about okay. SCI and the level of so, independence involved. Okay, I do wanna, because it seems the, re the report, the McGovern report is clear that the commissioner, I think makes a persuasive case that he exceeded his authority. That's a finding that I accept. But I, but I guess here's where I do think there seems to be a legitimate concern that we have not seen the kind of systemic investigations from SCI that we've seen in NYCHA. <coughs> there was, there's no equivalent of the lead investigation in SCI. There's no equivalent of the safety investigations that we've seen in ACS and SCI. And I guess, how do, how do you feel about, what, what, do you, what would you make of the performance of SCI when it comes to investigating broader operational failures at the DOE? One example is the delays in the busing. You know, what, no one knows what role SCI is playing. I have no idea what role SCI is playing. Um, and that's been in the da on the Daily News front page for weeks, um, months ago, but. Yeah, I, and um, look, it certainly is very surprising that there haven't been systemic reports that relate to DOE, given its size. Um, I think some of the incidents that we all know about from the press and from being citizens of the city. So I, I have to imagine that certainly in the last six months or so that um, it's maybe been difficult for SCI to focus on its work. That's just a guess from the outside. Reading but even before the last six months, I've seen no in my five years in the city council, I'm not aware of a single report from SCI that exposed a systemic failure. And DOE is not one agency among many, it's a third of the city budget. Yet it seems like the office is far less effective than inspector generals and much smaller agencies. Yeah, I think that that's a concern. So I, I, I just- I appreciate know, that. Right, but I just don't know enough today to, okay. to have a a recommendation or, or an answer, but um, but I certainly share the concerns that you've raised and that Councilman Traeger's raised. And, and I guess this is gonna be a tough question to answer, but the SEI emerges from the McGovern report more autonomous than ever. And so what what is the relationship between the DOI commissioner and the SEI commissioner? What's... Look, I think that the SEI still reports to the DOI commissioner I think there are, there are other ways of encouraging, inspiring, directing um, investigations that fall short of, um, I think, trying to take control of every aspect of SCI's operations, as was the subject of the McGovern report. So um, 
I, I don't think it's one or the other. I, I don't think it's either completely hands off with no leadership and, and no involvement um, or the degree of control that, that was criticized in the report. So um, I don't have the answers today, but um, I, as I said, I certainly share your concerns about the effectiveness of that agency and, and would like to learn more. Uh, early in the year, I had expressed when, when Commissioner Peters was accused of violating the whistleblower rights of Anastasia Coleman before the appointment of a special counsel, there were media reports indicating that Corporation Counsel was contemplating investigating those allegations against the commissioner, <coughs> which raised the question in my mind, does Corporation Counsel have the authority to investigate the DOI commissioner? What, what would be your thoughts on that question? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. That's my Council Member Cornegy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Garnett, for being here today. Um, fortunately or unfortunately for you, this is apropos for you being here today on a day when um, myself as the chair of the Housing and Buildings Committee and my borough president um, are calling for a thorough uh, investigation of the city's uh, third party transfer program, which is administered through uh, HPD, which uh, is reported to uh, be disproportionately impacting the transfer of wealth of properties of African American and Latino and minority uh, constituents in the borough. Um, we saw today two cases uh, in particular where um, homes were transferred uh, with a purported value each of 1.5 million, no mortgage, one for uh, $1,000 in water uh, was, was transferred to a third party, a nonprofit, um, and the other for $30,000 in, in outstanding value, uh, in outstanding violations. Um, <laughs> and when we've uh, attempted to get from HPD the criteria by which at least these types of properties uh, were transferred, we've been unable, unable to do it uh, at this point. I just want to know, this is like a clear-cut example of DOI intervention potentially yielding uh, some information that could protect a particular demographic in the city. Uh, I'm curious as to what your willingness would be uh, to, to do a thorough investigation from your vantage point on an agency like HPD. Um, I, I'm certainly happy to investigate any agency in the city that there's credible allegations of, of misconduct or corruption. Um, so I don't, um, I don't have a view of one agency versus another, and, and I'll confess I don't know much about the city's third-party transfer program. Certainly at the Attorney General's office, we have a real estate enforcement unit within the criminal division that has done really terrific work, I think, on um, deed theft and other um, circumstances where bad actors have taken advantage of, of elderly or ap otherwise absentee um, property owners in the city. So I know a little bit about sort of deed theft and how it's possible to do that. Um, from what I understand, uh, your reference to third party transfer is not necessarily criminal misconduct in that same way. Um, so I don't know much about the specifics, but um, I'm happy to look into it and have a further conversation with you about, about those concerns. Well, I, I appreciate your answer. The reason I didn't actually bring up uh uh, deed theft, deed fraud, and or lien sales, which, uh, which is the trifecta that's uh, displacing the most homeowners in communities of color across the city is because um, it was mentioned before that the um, city's, these New York City's purview over particular things, um, I wanted to be specific on HPD, our purview over uh, HPD in particular, but it is that trifecta that I'd like to overall look, look for. We don't, we're not clear whether or not, um, I wasn't clear whether or not DOI, the city's DOI, had the purview to look at uh, the judicial system, which we believe is culpable uh, in some of these transfers, uh, especially through um, lien sale. So it's, it's an overarching idea, and certainly I'd love to be able to collaborate in the future, uh, c trying to find a way to stem the tide of this transfer of wealth uh, in particular communities that are gentrifying throughout the city. Yeah, and, and I'd be happy to continue that conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Yeager. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, 
uh, congratulations on uh, your nomination and uh, I look forward to continuing conversations for the next three years as a member of uh, Mr. Chair Torres's committee. Um, uh, you'll be from time to time appearing before us. Um, I'll be the one smiling. Richie will be the one doing what he does. Um, but I, I wanted to uh, just go into a little bit of uh, what Mr. Speaker uh, spoke with you about earlier today. And he inquired if you had read the McGovern report and you indicated that you did. And uh, two words I wrote down from your response were uh, that you found it shocking and troubling. Um, is that reflection limited to the conduct of the former commissioner or do you find that uh, in your reading of the report that there may have been other people at DOI that uh, should you uh, be recommended by this committee uh, to the floor and the council uh, confirms you, uh, you will ultimately have to look at other conduct from other people. Or if you're not comfortable saying so, you can choose that as well. Um, yeah, I think I, I agree that there's other people talked about in the report um, with potentially troubling conduct. I. I don't feel comfortable discussing personnel matters here, but I think that's one of the first orders of business is to, um, to look into that, yes. Um, do you ever believe it's appropriate for a law enforcement agency to talk about an investigation that's ongoing with details of the ongoing investigation? Um, of a criminal investigation? No. Or of an investigatory investigation. DOI is kind of hybrid because not every investigation is necessarily criminal in nature although in, at times it can become criminal, but uh, at, at its essence, it's there to find out, uh, to discover, uh, to produce a report, and sometimes a recommendation, a referral to an appropriate prosecutor. DOI itself, as you know, is not a prosecutor. You are a prosecutor right now. Um, but in my view, and there's a reason that the Charter requires uh, one of the job uh, requirements of the commissioner is to be admitted to practice law in this state. Um, I think there's a higher level of, of um, appropriate conduct uh, that can be expected of an officer of the court when it comes to leading an investigatory agency that's not necessarily a prosecutorial agency but has somewhat hybrid uh, powers. So with that framework, is it ever appropriate for an investigatory agency such as DOI to publicly state uh, an investigation is occurring in the manner which happened last week? Um, I, I think my baseline answer would be no. Um, I, I think there are always circumstances that will be exceptions. Um, so I hesitate to say that I could never imagine any circumstance in which it would be appropriate. And, um, but I think as a general matter, um, statements to the public or leaks to the press, um, while investigations are ongoing, uh, it, it is difficult to imagine a circumstance where I would so, think that would be So to frame what happened last week, uh, it, was, it was a correspondence that was a public correspondence. It wasn't uh, an internal conversation uh, with a superior or, um, or an in-camera conversation with a legislative body, for example, or with a member of the judiciary overseeing a case, but it was a public letter, a defense of a record, if you will. And, uh, um, you know, prosecutors have, have certain guidelines, tenets that they have to abide by. Obviously, DOI commissioner not being a sworn prosecutor per se, it's a little different, but that's why I referenced the point about being an officer of the court and having certain obligations to, be tr to speak truthfully, uh, to, to be, to, to be uh, I guess, I guess uh, circumspect with the information that one states, needing only to state that which is necessary to be stated so as to, as you say, as you said at the beginning, the DOI has the ability to destroy people's careers, uh, lives, make things at least uncomfortable for people. And here what we had is correspondence that the, its sole purpose was uh, to, you know, fire parting shots on the way out the door. Um, you know, that's my characterization, it doesn't have to be yours, man. But my point, again, is, is putting aside the broader question of whether or not coming before the council and speaking about it or having an in-camera conversation with the speaker or the chair of a relevant committee, as Mr. Chair Torres uh, spoke about earlier, the broad uh, uh, um, uh, document that was released to the public that set forth that there were several investigations that had not been completed and detailed information about those investigations. 
you believe under those set of circumstances, is it appropriate to do that? No. Okay. Um, you read the letter, I assume? Yes. Okay. Do you find it credible? Um, I don't have any basis to judge whether or not it's credible. I, I, I do know that um, as far as the, the portion of the letter that might relate to me, the concern that any future DOI commission would be chilled, um, I, I, I can assure you that I will not be chilled, and to the extent that anyone, Mr. Peters or in the administration or otherwise, thinks that I will be intimidated or, or chilled, I think they'll be sorely disappointed. Good for them. Uh, for being sorely disappointed, because I, I believe you, and I take you at your word, uh, should this council confirm you, that when you take the oath, uh, it, it has the words faithfully execute and the, the duties of the office, and uh, you'll swear to do that, and I believe you will, and you're an officer of the court, and you've already taken an oath, um, and you've taken your oath uh, as, a, as a deputy attorney general, and uh, I believe you will be trusted uh, to do your job in accordance with the oath. Um, there was an allegation in the letter, I'm not going to drag you through the entirety of the letter, but there was an allegation in the letter that um, a member of the NYPD had uh, brandished his firearm. Um, you read that? Um, I, 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 I saw the characterization that there was displayed an NYPD his fire, officer. Displayed a sidearm in an had effort to... Had a visibly to, displayed firearm at the meeting, yes. If you were commissioner, you were anybody, if you work if, in your current job, in any job you've ever held, um, and in a position to have a conversation with, um, during the course of your official duties, with a member of law enforcement who uh, displayed a firearm in the manner described in the letter, would the first time anybody have ever heard about that been in a letter issued many months later? Um, no, I, I um, Is it fair to say it, you would have, you would have gone to the supervisor you would have reported it to a, to a superior officer of some kind, notifying your own security personnel, perhaps? Uh, yeah, if someone had brandished a firearm, I, I, I can't, yes, that's a very Displayed, I, I'm using I the mean, word brandished. I, I think the word is displayed or, or, or somehow indicated that, that the sidearm was carried. Right, um, it, it, it's not clear to me from the letter what, what occurred. I, I, I will say that, um, I have interacted with police officers and federal agents and my own investigators pretty much every single day of the last 13 years and in almost all of those meetings. Um, when they're in my office with the jacket off, they have a visibly displayed firearm. So um, I, I find it a little bit unusual that someone in law enforcement would find a visibly displayed firearm to be um, meaningful outside of the ordinary course. But I've same, course, same here. I don't know the facts. Um, I, I want to uh, just inquire very briefly on a topic that uh, Chair Torres asked you about. Um, I, I do agree uh, that you know, the, when you have the sensitive position of heading an investigatory agency with law enforcement powers and uh, the, the specifics as laid out in the charter, and it is a sensitive job, but at the same time, uh, as the Chair indicated, the Council does has o have oversight over that agency. Um, and as the lead, as the head of the agency, that would be you. And, <coughs> bless you. Excuse me. And you'd be, uh, and you'd be appearing from time to time before the council, and that's in public. Do you believe that that a process can be fairly and ethically uh, created in which you are able to, from time to time, without? a broad rule about it, but from time to time, as the case may be, on sensitive issues where uh, the council is looking into something, or the chair is looking into something, or you're aware that it may, you know, you, the two may somehow meet for you to have an in-camera conversation with the chairman or the speaker? Yeah, I, I certainly think that this, it is possible to design a process in which both sides could have confidence um, that we had a shared understanding of the need for confidentiality, um, that th there might be some frustrations on, on both sides at times. I think that's inevitable, but I certainly think it's possible to design a process um, that could give both sides some, some comfort um, and a greater ability to share information. And as a prosecutor from time to time, you've had uh, 
and also as, as a clerk for a judge from time to time, I assume you've had the ability to participate in in-camera conversations, the purpose of which is designed to not be made public, but where it's important for the appropriate authorities to have shared information so that everybody is sort of on the same page and that there's no surprises caught, but more importantly because there are shared responsibilities and if two separate agencies, yourself and for example the council, the legislative body, are going down two different paths, um, not being aware of, for example, I mean, the council can actually be doing something that interferes with your investigation. You may need to have a conversation uh, with the speaker or with the chairman to make sure that that doesn't occur. So you're comfortable doing that from time to time and to uh, work with the council to create a process, doesn't, not with me, not with the other members, but with the speaker and with the chairman so that you can have that comfort that you're able to share information confidentially uh, with the council. Yes, as you said, I've certainly been part of those types of conversations in the past, and, and I think that it is possible to design a process that, that would make that, that possible under appropriate circumstances. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, uh, Madam Chair, thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity, not as a member of the committee, uh, for abiding, for indulging me. Good luck. Thank you. Godspeed. Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> um, I thought it was strange. There was uh, the letter that uh, Councilmember Yeager just referenced that was addressed to myself and uh, Chair Torres <coughs> uh, from the previous commissioner, which did not go into detail but alluded to specifically investigations. Again, I don't know if these investigations are real. I have no information. But the letter said what the letter said, and you indicated, Ms. Garnett, that you read that letter. So the previous commissioner disclosed, if it is true, that there are potential investigations. In BuzzFeed, he was, I guess, reached on the phone and he was asked about an investigation related to Phil Yor and the NYPD on um, members of the NYPD lying, and he said that he didn't comment on investigations. So I, I found that to be strange, that we got a letter that was disclosed to the press. I actually got, the press got that letter before I got that letter. I was given that letter by a member of the press before I received it, which detailed investigations. But then when asked about an issue that's of importance to the council, again, I don't know if there's anything there there. He said he doesn't comment on investigations. How do you square that from the conversation that we've had today? I don't think it can be squared. You don't believe it can be squared? Um, I, I don't know what was in Mr. Peter's mind, and um, I certainly think that um, the, the proper response is not to comment publicly on ongoing investigations. Um, I agree with you that there seems to be a conflict between the letter, the discussion that's in the letter that was released in response to his termination, um, and the stated position that no comment can be made on ongoing investigations. I agree with you. I found it to be strange, and I, I couldn't square it either, <clears throat> which is why I'm glad we're having a conversation today, and it's been, I think, a pretty detailed conversation with no, um, I think, inappropriate or uh, over-the-line commitment from you on uh, disclosing things that you would deem to uh, in, in danger an ongoing investigation, but as Chair Torres and uh, Chair Traeger and uh, as uh, our colleague, Councilmember Yeager, just pointed out in his line of questioning, figuring out the right balance, uh, not publicly, uh, but how <coughs> the council's charter mandated oversight of city agencies is complemented by DOI's investigations and the symbiotic productive relationship that can occur between this oversight body, which has uh, limited uh, ability, we have some ability, but we don't have the same tools in the arsenal that DOI has in getting certain information. And so um, I'm happy to hear a level of commitment in once you, if you become DOI commissioner, understanding and exploring that appropriate balance of what is the, the right balance of uh, meeting with us, having conversations with us, working with us in a productive fashion on issues that are important to this body and issues that are important to DOI. I think Chair Traeger has really pointed out the, uh, the size and breadth of the Department of Investigation and the fact that 
uh, as chair of that committee, he has no idea if the Special Com Commissioner of Investigation or DOI generally has been looking into anything related to that. And, not, and us not wanting to do it for, to try to sort of peek under the curtain, but to just understand if there are issues that we should be looking at through the budget process, if there are issues that we should be looking at through our oversight process when we have the chancellor or commissioners come in here. And so I think it's very helpful to hear this conversation today. And to be honest, I'm not sure I ever felt comfortable having this conversation before related to DOI. And partly I think it's because of the, the strength of DOI and want, you know, and and how I felt previous leadership comported themselves, and not really feeling totally comfortable in being able to have a level of conversation like this. So I'm grateful we're having this conversation today. I just have one question, uh, and then I know we have other uh, another round of questions. I also want to praise Commissioner Peters. Again, I said in my opening statement, the work he did at ACS, the work he did at NYCHA, the work he did at MOX, the work he did at the Department of Corrections, the work he did uh, at many agencies, which I think resulted in good reports with good recommendations. Those are all good things, and I want to see that work continue. Are there any particular things that you feel passionate about? Are there any particular areas that given your experience in the Attorney General's office and in the Southern District, in the U.S. Attorney's office, that you think DOI has already been working on, which is of interest to you, or you haven't seen DOI work on, but is an interest just to explore. You know, uh, Councilmember Chin raised a real important issue around social <coughs> adult daycare centers um, and Medicaid fraud involved. Are there any other areas Generally, not specifically, because I don't want you to tip the hand if you are going to pursue something when you get in there, but generally issue area. Are there issue areas that are important to you that you feel passionate about that you look forward to um, looking at when, if you become DOI commissioner? Um, there's no one particular subject matter. I mean, certainly as a prosecutor, um, and my experience as a prosecutor, there's aspects of city government that I know a lot more about and have um, a lot more insight into their operations, including NYPD and corrections. Um, and in my time at the AG's office, I think that understanding has expanded. Um, some of the discussion that we had about the housing and real estate issues, I've learned a lot more about in the past year. Um, it wasn't something I knew much about at the U.S. Attorney's office. But I think I'm approaching this with, um, I hope, some humility and a recognition that um, DOI's purview is so wide and there are um, huge aspects of city government that uh, sitting here today I know almost nothing about. And I think that you make the best decisions with the best information. So I do expect to develop over time um, priorities for things DOI should focus on. I think that um, from my perspective, it would be disrespectful to the career staff at DOI to um, make those commitments now. I'd like to get there, meet with the people who've been doing the work, who are closest to the agencies that they oversee, hear from them what's going on, what they've seen, what they'd like to work on, and filter up from those conversations what should be the priorities agency-wide. And lastly, uh, uh, Councilmember Yeager uh, just uh, spoke to this, and I'm not asking uh, this in a specific way, but in a general way since you were just asked about it. You said at the beginning of the questioning today, at the beginning of this hearing, that you read the entire McGovern report. That's correct, right? Yes, I, 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 I may have skimmed some pages, but I read the entire thing, yes. And Councilmember Yeager just asked you a question about the personnel at uh, the Department of Investigation. I'm not asking for any specific changes. I know you would have to, if you're confirmed, uh, get in there, understand where things stand, talk to the top level staff, but um, I would assume that any leader, uh, any council member, any speaker, any commissioner would probably seek to have people that they know and trust, that they've worked with in the past in previous professional capacities and would you be looking uh, to complement 
the existing executive staff with uh, your own people, people that you've had a working relationship with in the past? Uh, yes, I'd like to have some of my own people come with me, yes. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I, I want to say, Ms. Garnett, I, I'm very impressed. I'm done, and I know we have other questions. Uh, I'm going to leave, um, but I'll leave you in good hands. And I, and I want to say, you know, I'm very impressed with um, your temperament, your knowledge, <clears throat> your professionalism, your career, the interactions that we had uh, privately, which was only once uh, last week before the Thanksgiving holiday, a meeting we had with uh, Chair Kozlowitz and Chair Torres, where we asked extensive questions, not all the same as the questions today, but they were serious, hard questions, and I thought they were answered in a very thoughtful, professional um, manner, which gave, which gave me a lot of confidence even before this hearing today. Your written responses gave me similar confidence. Your opening statement gave me confidence in the way you've comported yourself and conducted yourself today, sometimes not answering the way maybe council members would want you to answer, but answering it in a thoughtful, measured, um, fair way. And for me, I think the commissioner of this agency, it's a very tricky job. It's not an easy job. And it requires someone that, of course, has fidelity to the law, but also fidelity to fairness and how investigations are conducted, how they are disclosed, and how you work with other levels of government. And so I feel confident in your ability to lead this agency. Uh, I don't speak for the entire council, and we have not had a conversation about this uh, yet, but I look forward to supporting uh, your nomination. Uh, today's hearing has given me confidence in your ability to lead this agency. And I do that um, with the hope that we can have a productive working relationship together to benefit New Yorkers across the board, especially the most vulnerable, and having a city council and a department of investigations that is able to uncover corruption, waste, fraud, and abuse, and come up with specific policy recommendations to benefit the lives of New Yorkers who rely upon government to get things right and do things better. So I look forward to supporting your nomination, and I look forward to working with you, should the other members of this body agree with the support of your nomination for the betterment of our city. And, I look, and I'm really grateful for your testimony today, how you've answered our questions, and your temperament. Thank you very much, Ms. Garnett, and I'm gonna turn it back to Chair Kozlowitz. Thank you, I appreciate that very much. Council Member Traeger. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. I just have a couple of follow-up questions. Um, the speaker mentioned, uh, and my colleague, uh, Councilman Torres, mentioned, and, and I mentioned earlier about the fact that I am not familiar with any um, systemic investigations of the DOE within, within the past five years. The inquiries that I did mention before, namely uh, with school buses, were not housed with SCI. These inquiries are housed with, with a federal invest body or, or, or others. So I am seeking further clarity on the structure because a lot's been reported in the press, but we really haven't heard folks here under oath about this structure. Um, the fact that for, for, a number, for all these years, there's been no systemic investigations of the largest department in our city, but the fact that federal agents are investigating, I think that warrants an inquiry. Uh, is there anything in the law, based on your understanding, that prohibits DOI from initiating its own investigation of, of the DOE, even with this structure that has been talked about quite a bit? Um, I, I'm not sure. I, honestly, I'm still uh, getting up to speed as a legal matter about the divisions between SCI and DOI and how that works. 
um, you know, it's clear that SCI is, is part of DOI in one sense and that the special commissioner reports to the commissioner of DOI. Um, it has its own independent budget and um, historically under Mr. Condon operated with a great deal of independence. Um, but I think that the special commissioner is still answerable to the commissioner of DOI and the kinds of questions that you're raising about um, how they're allocating resources, what investigations are underway, I certainly think that um, those are conversations that if I'm confirmed I would expect to have with, with Ms. Coleman in order just at the beginning to learn myself about um, what kinds of investigations they're pursuing, how the resources are being used um, to get Ms. Coleman's perspective on, on what they should be doing and, and have hopefully a productive conversation about that. Right. So I just know so little right sitting here right now, um, but, but I share your concerns and I look forward hopefully to having that conversation. Because we, right now we rely, whether on a press report, we rely on news from the federal government, we rely on a controller's audit or report where sometimes the DOE is overspending bloated contracts, problematic contracts. Meanwhile, we have a dedicated investig investigatory body that's supposed to do this work. Mm -hmm. And we really haven't heard anything other than just, you know, personnel matters. And I, I would just like to know and get, you know, further clarity from you and you may not, you know, have all the answers here today. Under what circumstances would you inform SCI that this is an issue that has come to your attention, we should investigate this, e even in the face of an action on the part of SCI? Can you speak about this type of scenario? Um, again, I want to be careful because I don't, uh I don't know, sitting here today, all the details about the nature of that relationship, but it's clear that SCI is answerable to the commissioner of DOI, and so I think that it's, as a general matter, entirely appropriate for the commissioner to be uh, talking with the special commissioner of investigation about what investigations are ongoing, to be up to speed on those, to be giving direction and advice about um, the conduct of those investigations. And um, I, I, it's not my understanding, sitting here today, um, that the independence of SCI means that they have no oversight whatsoever, or the commissioner of DOI has no role in directing those investigations. Um, so I think, as I've said, I share your concerns. Um, I'm eager to learn more about uh, what they have underway um, and talk to Ms. Coleman about what her vision is for the operation of that of that part of DOI. Because I'm just eager to know whether DOI could itself initiate an investigation, even in the face of the structure that has been talked about quite a bit. Obviously, Commissioner Peters, in, in his office, <coughs> did. Uh, they but based on press reports, there were inquiries, and I think that's what led to a lot of a lot of the, the, the tension. Uh, you also have within DOE OSI which is their own internal investigatory uh, group. Some things might get kicked around to SCI, back to OSI, DOI, but the, the question remains, I cannot believe, and it's hard for me to believe sitting here today, that for the past five years, no complaints or have been reported to SCI that are systemic in nature and no, no report that we could point to. So I plead with you today that this is a matter of great importance, especially the fact that, you know, we're talking about over one million of, of, of our school, school children, we're talking about a, a third, over a third of our city budget, an issue that is of great importance to this council, that we get clarity on the structure and that uh, proper and effective oversight and independence uh, is uh, are, are, are paramount. And I, I would appreciate your commitment to that. And I, again, once again, congratulate you on your nomination. Thank you. Council Member Landa. Thanks very much, uh, Madam Chair. And uh, Ms. Garnett, thank you very much for sticking around for what's become now a, a long hearing. Um, so I actually just want to kind of uh, correct the record on my first round of, of testimony and ask you sort of a, um, 
the questions around a couple of the investigations, and in particular the ones um, around potential issues of, of non-consequence for lying of NYPD officers, to me it's, it's not a question of sort of um, internal power struggle at DOI and NYPD. It's a question that really matters for the, the, the integrity of the NYPD and of DOI itself. I'll start by saying, you know, there's no, you know, that report looks at a pretty small percentage of off the, excuse me, the BuzzFeed investigation um, in place of any report from the NYPD IG or DOI that we saw, looked at a couple of hundred officers and had several dozen serious allegations. That's out of obviously over the years it looked at 50,000 plus officers. So I think we're talking about 99% of officers plus. But for the small percentage of officers that are identified in the work that BuzzFeed did, some very serious and troubling allegations about lying, about use of force, lying on the record, lying in court, lying in internal investigations. Um, and so I just want to make sure that you understand, you know, in addition to the issues you have to deal with internally as you set up the structure, um, I just want to make sure, you know, you know from us and hear from you also that that's an issue that just like you spoke to Councilmember Traeger about people who would come in here and lie to us and how serious that would be, especially in a state which is one of just a handful in the country where officer disciplinary records are shielded from public record, that that's a really core and important role of DOI and the NYPD IG and it's something that you would take seriously and want to look at and make sure was um, given the attention it merited. Yes, I think it's a serious issue. Um, so, I, I mean, I think you said before that it was something you would take a look at, um, obviously without knowing, you know, and I, did you get a chance, I mean, had you read, not today's article, BuzzFeed article, but the earlier report um, that dug into these dismissal probation cases? No, I don't think I have seen that. All right. Can I ask that you, uh, after today, read that earlier article which looks at cases of dismissal probation and a series of files that BuzzFeed was able to get? Um, that raise a serious set of issues in which we have not had a report from the IG on. I don't know whether they looked and concluded that there wasn't something there from their point of view or what happened at all, but um, will you agree to take a look at that article? It's not a long, not a long read uh, in addition to your dialogue with Inspector General Yor as you figure out what, uh, what's appropriate going forward there. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, thank you again for the indulgence in the long hearing. Council Member Torres. No, I, I want to follow up on on both Councilmember Lander and Councilmember Traders, and this will be my final round of questioning. Um, th there is a sense in which mm -hmm. DOI is even more empowered to investigate individual misconduct on the part of an <coughs> officer than even CCRP. Right? You have subpoena Certainly. power, you're a law enforcement agency, you could arrest. I think one of my criticisms of DOI, and I've, I've, I've said it publicly to Commissioner Peters, is I'm aware of no instance in which DOI has held an individual officer accountable for misconduct. Close. Is that a dynamic you're willing to change? Um, yeah, I, I have been part at the U.S. Attorney's Office of prosecuting police officers for misconduct um, at, at federal agents also. Um, so I have some experience doing that and, and I don't, um, obviously there are, as Councilman Lander alluded to, there's there are some rules and structures that are different for police officers, but in terms of DOI's obligation to hold all city employees to account for their behavior, um, within that broad purview, I don't see why police officers should be treated differently than other city employees. I'm, I'm actually happy with that response. Um, historically, SCI has been insulated from city council oversight. Our oversight over SCI has been through DOI. But now that SCI has been established as fundamentally independent of DOI, in spite of whatever reporting obligation it might have to the DOI commissioner, should SCI come before the city council on its own, or should you be testifying before the city council on behalf of SCI when it comes to budgetary matters? Um, I don't think I know enough to have an informed view on that. I, I, I think. Um, I expect to, if I'm confirmed, to sometimes be back here uh, to testify in my capacity as DOI commissioner. I think there will, I would imagine there would be many other instances where um, other staff or IGs would be the more appropriate um, witness. So I, I just don't know enough about the relationship between the council and SCI and DOI commissioner to have an informed view that's specific to SCI. 
do, do you feel DOI has the authority to investigate DOE or matter relating to DOE independently of SCI? Like if SCI said, you know, we're not interested in looking at this, what, but DO, could DOI investigate in the absence of SCI? Um, I'm not sure. I'd have okay. to talk to, um, you know, counsel at, at DOI. I'd want to make sure we were acting within the lawful authority of DOI, but um, I, I think if that authority were available to DOI separate from SCI, and if I ever felt that SCI was not looking at something that merited review, if we had the authority to do so, I, I'd be willing to do that. I just don't know sitting here today if, if, that's, if we have the lawful authority to do that. Now, it's been said that DOI can not only investigate city agencies, but you can investigate those who do business with the city, receive subsidies from the city, some kind of benefit from the city. Uh, it's been pointed out that the city of New York owns a subway. In your, in your opinion, does DOI have the authority to investigate the MTA? Um, my understanding sitting here today is no. I think that's that's um, unfortunate in some ways yeah. as a citizen. Um, it is unfortunate. Yeah. Um, actually, a question about law enforcement. Uh, you've had interactions with DOI in your current, in your I guess your previous capacity as the head of the criminal division, in the <laughs> attorney general's office. What were those interactions with DOI, and how is DOI perceived within the broader law enforcement community? Um, so. I've had a number of cases um, at the Attorney General's office in which DOI is the investigative agency, um, as well as um, <coughs> less personal involvement, but I'm certainly aware of a number of cases at the U.S. Attorney's office in which DOI was the investigating agency, um, including some very significant cases like the city time um, fraud case. So I think that the, the career staff at DOI is an outstanding reputation. Um, they, have, they have terrific investigators and lawyers working there, and I'm looking forward to meeting some of them. That's great. And I know there were, there were a series of questions about the notion of commenting on investigations. And I'm wondering, to play devil's advocate for a moment, is there a difference between acknowledging the existence of an investigation and disclosing the details of an investigation. So I think we can all agree that the latter is utterly unacceptable. But do, is there something wrong with merely acknowledging an investigation? So if there's an issue, and we have our own oversight and investigations division, one issue about which there's been public outrage has been the series of fatalities in the carding industry. And members of the public wanna know what is the council doing about this? What is the mayor doing about this? What is DOI doing about this? Would it be wrong to say we're looking into this? We're acknowledging that we're looking into this, but we're not going to disclose exactly what we're looking into. Is that wrong? Um, I don't think that's always wrong. I, I, okay. I think that particularly in the oversight function, I could imagine situations where um, it would be could be appropriate for DOI to say that on a broad yeah. a broad subject area, we've received a referral from city council or the yeah. mayor's office, and and we are. Um, looking at so, so, so there's nothing intrinsically wrong with commenting on investigation as long as you're not disclosing details. Is that, would that be a fair statement? I, I think you have to be very careful and there should be a bias towards I less guess. disclosure rather than more because of the concerns that I've identified. So I think it's, it's, it's I could imagine situations where it would be appropriate, um, but I think because of the concerns, the bias should be towards not. And I have a, a question about whistleblowing. Much has been said about the McGovern report, which is quite persuasive and compelling, and I think no one here would ever want to be the target of a McGovern report. <laughs> I, I know but, Jim a little but, bit personally. He's but, very impressive. No, it's a, it's, it was an impressive document. Um, but I, I do have questions about his, the, what, and I'm not a lawyer, so but what I take to be the breadth of his interpretation of whistleblower law. So we often hear the three words, corruption, fraud, and abuse. And corruption and fraud seem straightforward to me. Uh, abuse seems more of a, of a gray area, and I'm wondering, what is, where's the line between insubordination and conscientious objection, or insubordination and whistleblowing? So I, I could present you with a quick hypothetical. Suppose I'm the speaker of the city council, and I have a wonderful lawyer named Mark Traeger. And I asked Mark, I need you to draft the bill regulating commercial rents in New York City. And Mark says, you know, I have concerns about whether the city council has the authority to do that. 
and he and I have this back and forth over the course of several weeks, and he just refuses to draft the bill, and at some point, as the speaker, I say, I'm gonna have to fire you, right? Because ultimately, I'm the speaker, I'm in charge, I make the determination about what laws we draft here. Am I, is he an insubordinate employee, or is he a whistleblower? I, I think it's so dependent on the facts and circumstances. I think that um, when a informed employee raises concerns that they are being directed to undertake actions that they think would violate the law, um, that merits the most serious thoughtful consideration, particularly in a law enforcement agency. So um, sometimes these are complex, difficult questions, but um, I think if at a minimum, it's clear to me that that is very troubling and um, could give some rise to whistleblower protection. So it's, it, it is very difficult to talk about hypotheticals without knowing all the facts. I agree it can be a complex and, thing. And you, know, one, you, know, you could also you could ascribe nefarious motivations or you can assume that there's a, a good faith disagreement about what the law actually says, right? Yes, and that's why these questions are very complicated. Okay. Uh, I, I want to I thank you for your testimony, and I, like the speaker, I've been thoroughly impressed with you. I have every intention of voting for you, and I look forward to working with you. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> I will now open up the floor to the public for comments. Comments are limited to only three minutes. Also, if you have a written statement, Please provide a copy of that statement to the sergeant at arms for distribution. We have um, three people that want to testify. Uh, Tawaki Kamatsu. Can you have her? Okay, um, will you begin, please? Um, sure. The reason, why I'm, the reason why I'm here today is to oppose the proposed nomination of the candidate for this position, only because the mayor is actually technically without legal authority to nominate. I testified previously to uh, Mr. Torres on, let's see, uh, March 26th at a city council meeting. Um, during that testimony, um, that testimony was recorded on video. I'm looking at a video of that testimony, so um, I think for today's testimony, I'll just play back that video for your benefit, as well as the audience. Okay, just give me one sec. On January 8th, I tried testifying in opposition to what is that? Bill in the blue room. Received. What is that? Uh, members of the NYPD actually tried sure. to. Sure. Basically, I testified um, before Richie Torres on March 26th at his oversight committee meeting. Um, during that testimony, I told him very explicitly that the mayor's NYPD security detail illegally excluded me from public meetings while he was running for re-election. During that testimony, I pointed out very explicitly that that particular act constitutes voter fraud and voter suppression. Um, I testified at other public hearings. I've made it aware to members of the journalism field who have opted to censor that. Um, while, I, while I sit before you today, I have two lawsuits. I have one against the city of New York in federal court. I talked to Mr. Yeager over there previously during a city council meeting. Um, he advised me to send him an email. I did that. There was no response. I also have a New York State Supreme Court lawsuit against HRA. Um, the reason why this meeting is being held today is for oversight. You're trying to make a decision as to whether to um, essentially replace Mark Peters. Um, I met with DOI in their offices as a whistleblower. I gave them information. They didn't act. That information was against the NYPD in regards to being excluded from public hearings such as this. 
also with regards to HRA where there's no oversight. So let me just, I guess, close with this. Um, like I said at the outset, the mayor had absolutely no legal authority whatsoever to have nominated uh, Ms. Garnett today for this position. Um, and the truth of the matter is there hasn't been any uh, performance by DOI, DOI in the past such that I've had to resort to legal action against the city and it's going to encompass the deficiencies within DOI and HRA when I file papers in the next two days. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, may I inquire? Hmm? May I inquire, Madam Chair? Mayor. Your testimony is that the mayor doesn't have the authority to nominate a commissioner of the Department of Investigations? Absolutely not. Because, and the reason for that, I think- Because you haven't said the yeah, reason. You have to talk into the mic. So with regards to that, um, it's all about voter fraud and voter suppression. People had a decision- It's all about what? Voter fraud and voter suppression. Um, people had a decision to make when the mayor was reelected. If I was serving as a whistleblower at his public town hall meetings, his public resource fair meetings prior to the primaries, prior to the general election, and I was illegally excluded from those meetings, that is voter fraud and voter suppression. Therefore, his re-election was um, achieved through voter fraud and suppression. Okay, gotcha. Just wanted to make sure I understood the legal basis for your point that the mayor couldn't make this nomination. Got it, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, Kelly Grace. Good afternoon, my name is Kelly Grace Price. I'm one of the co-founders of Close Rosies, the organizing project to close the Rose M. Singer Center, the all-female jail on Rikers Island. I would just like to take a moment to comment on the previous testimony. I know this gentleman. This is a gentleman who's always at public hearings. He's a war veteran, and I understand um, his anger and his rage at having his voice blocked and constantly muted from public discourse. And this gentleman shows up at every meeting and just asks for his voice to be heard. And I just wanted to thank this committee for taking him seriously and for giving him a question. That, uh, even though his comments might be ad hoc, I, I do feel that there needs to be a broader place for public input, um, however we work that out. My specific issue has always been around working on sexual violence. Uh, as an innocent person, I was thrown into the Rose M. Singer Center. I won't take this opportunity to lambast Cy Vance, but I, I really am one of the first people that was screaming about um, the very poor policies and procedures that Mr. Vance uses in his office um, under the guise of acting to help um, victims and survivors. He knew I was a survivor, and yet he threw me into Rikers Island. Um, I went to Mount Holyoke. I had no idea what was going on in Rikers Island. The only time I'd ever been arrested was in Boulder, Colorado, when I had been pushing my Vespa home drunk one night. I had no idea how to deal with the criminal justice system. Um, and I was a very savvy person. I had been running photojournalists in and out of war zones for a, a very long time. But I want to talk specifically about how, in all of these hearings, no one ever talks about how we're going to reform the way that sexual assault and sexual rape investigations against um, city agents and agencies are performed. Um, this is a role that the DOI is the fulcrum in uh, re regarding the um, Department of Correction. The DOI has the aegis to take investigations of rape and sexual assault, as you know, which is a hot button issue. We just uh, forced um, a, a tri-committee hearing on the issue back in September. But the DOI has the ages to take these investigations away from the internal docs DOI and investigate them, but we have no transparency on when or where these investigations are lobbied back and forth, when they end, when they don't. As you know, you've probably heard from your colleagues on the, the Women's Issues Committee, um, on the um, Criminal Justice Committee, and on the Judiciary Committee that Rape and sexual assault on Rikers Island is the issue that has been hidden and swept aside and swept under the rug. But this is ubiquitous in all of our city agencies. Look, let's look at the mess just in city government when your own staffers need to elevate a complaint of rape and sexual assault. That's a mess. Uh, the same thing with the Department of Education. We need a department investigation that takes Me Too investigations very seriously. And I would really emphasize that going forward in, ex in exploring this candidate's 
um, qualifications, that this is a line of questioning that you really take up with her because our voices are being muted. We have absolutely no one to turn to and no one doing investigations. As women, as the majority of the population in this city, the most sacrosanct promise you can offer us is protection, and now you have a moment to help us, and I would appreciate it if you would seize that moment. Thank you for listening to me. And the last one, Tatiana Gooden. I hope I said your name right. Yeah. How you doing? Hi. Do you have any written documentation you would like uh, us no. to read? No? Take a seat. Make sure you identify yourself for the record. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Tatiana Gooden. Um, I have a specific concern, um, and specifically what was um, written by Mr. Peters in his November 19th letter, um, specifically on page 8 and 7, regarding uh, other investigations not, not yet made public, but known to the administration and involving senior agency officials and uh, senior agency officials, the mayor, and public safety, um, and that these investigations are currently in place and have not been yet made public. Um, I'm, I have, think I have a good idea of what they are. Um, I had actually emailed um, Mr. Johnson and Mr. Torres and Mr. Pelniak evidence of um, what exactly that is. Um, I did that recently, and um, more of that can be found in the lawsuit that I filed, Gooden versus City of New York. My biggest concern is this. Um, I, from listening to Ms. Garnett, um, and especially the fact that she's had no connection to the mayor prior than two weeks ago when she first became a nominee, that makes me feel very um, confident. Um, my only concern is it seems like, um, I know that DOI has unfettered access, um, you know, by the powers that's given to it, unfettered access over every single person, every city employee from, you know, a janitor at NYCHA to the mayor, to the district attorneys, to the police commissioner. Um, they have unfettered access to the emails, to every single document, um, and so on. And I know that previously there was, you know, connection between Mr. Peters and the mayor that maybe prevented him from, or um, he chose not to do certain things that he should have. Um, but my, it, it just seems that DOI, just as a, in general, when it comes to investigating higher ranking, you know, the, the agency heads, and especially at the NYPD. I mean, Mr. Peters, like I said, he says one, he'll say one sentence in that letter. That sentence means a lot. It seems like DOI is, even though it has power to just walk in and surreptitiously pu pull emails and to, you know, they don't need to subpoena documents. They could just walk in and grab them off the shelf. And it just seems they're not doing it out of politics, out of trying to be polite, or out of, um, you know, that's just, you know, that's just, it, it was never done that way before. What can be, and, and again, I'm fully confident in Ms. Okay, and Ms. Garnett's, um, and, um, Independence, but how can City Council, especially the Oversight Committee uh, at City Council, how, how can they kind of um, encourage the DOI exercise that power um, more than it has? So, I um, no longer with us and. Uh, I feel confident that Ms. Garnett, Ms. Garnett will do a very good job. I mean, she testified today for almost three hours, and every question was asked of her that was asked of her, she answered without hesitation. 
So I feel very confident in her nomination. Yeah, so do I. Like I said, it's more of DOI exercising the powers that it has, you know. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> I thank our candidate, Ms. Garnett. I also thank our speaker and all council members, particularly the members of this committee. This rules committee advice and consent hearing now stands in recess to be continued on the morning of November 28th for committee vote. This meeting is recessed. We did it.